Chapter Seventeen of Running Water by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sylvia tells more than she knows. Hilary Chain stayed away from Dorsetshire for ten complete days, and though the hours crept by, dilatory as idlers at a street corner, he obtained some poor compensation by reflecting upon his fine diplomacy. In less than a week he would surely be missed. By the time that ten days had passed, the sensation might have become simply poignant. So for ten days he wandered about the downs of Sussex with an aching heart, saying the while, It serves her right. On the morning of the eleventh he received a letter from the war office, bidding him call on the following afternoon. "'That will just do,' he said. "'I will go down to Weymouth to-day, and I will return to London to-morrow.' And with an unusual lightness of spirit, which he ascribed purely to his satisfaction that he need punish Sylvia no longer, he started off upon his long journey. He reached the house of the running water by six o'clock in the evening, and at the outset it seemed that his diplomacy had been sagacious. He was shown into the library, and opposite to him by the window, Sylvia stood alone. She turned to him with a white, terror-haunted face, gazed at him for a second like one dazed, and then with a low cry of welcome came quickly toward him. Chayne caught her outstretched hands, and all his joy at her welcome lay dead at the sight of her distress. Sylvia! he exclaimed in distress. He was hurt by it as he had never thought to be hurt. I am afraid, she said in a trembling whisper. He drew her toward him, and she yielded. She stood close to him, and very still, touching him, leaning to him like a frightened child. "'Oh, I am afraid,' she repeated, and her voice appealed piteously for sympathy and a little kindness. In Chayne's mind there was suddenly painted a picture of the ice slope on the Aiguille d'Argentière. A girl had moved from step to step across that slope, looking down its steep, glittering incline without a tremor. It was the same girl who now leaned to him, and with shaking lips and eyes tortured with fear, cried, I am afraid. By his recollection of that day upon the heights, Chayne measured the greatness of her present trouble. Why, Sylvia, why are you afraid? For answer she looked toward the open window. Chayne followed her glance, and this was what he saw. The level stretch of emerald lawn, the stream running through it and catching in its brown water the red light of the evening sun, the great beech trees casting their broad shadows, the high garden walls with the dusky red of their bricks glowing amongst the fruit trees, and within that enclosure pacing up and down, in and out among the shadows of the trees, Garrett Skinner and Walter Hine. Yet that sight she must needs have seen before. Why should it terrify her beyond reason now? "'Do you see?' Sylvia said in a low, troubled voice. For once distress had mastered her, and she spoke without her usual reticence. "'There can be no friendship between those two, no real friendship. You have but to see them side by side to be sure of it. It is pretense.' Yet that, too, she must have known before. Why, then, should the pretense now so greatly trouble her? Chain watched the two men pacing in the garden. Certainly he had never seen them in so intimate a comradeship. Garrett Skinner had passed his arm through Walter Hines, and held him so, plying him with stories, bending down his keen, furrowed, aquiline face toward him, as though he had no thought in the world but to make him his friend and bind him with affection. And Walter Hine looked up and listened and laughed, a vain, weak wisp of a creature, flattered to the skies and defenceless as a rabbit. Why the pretense, said Sylvia, why the linked arms? The pretense has grown during these last days. What new thing is intended? Her eyes were on the garden, and as she looked it seemed that her terror grew. My father went away a week ago. Since he has returned, the pretense has increased. I am afraid, I am afraid. Garrett Skinner turned in his walk and led Walter Hine back toward the house. Sylvia shrank from his approach as from something devilish. When he turned again, she drew her breath like one escaped from sudden peril. "'Sylvia, of what are you afraid?' "'I don't know,' she cried. "'That's just the trouble. I don't know.' She clenched her hands together at her breast. Chain caught them in his, and was aware that in one shut palm she held something which she concealed. 
Her clasp tightened upon it as his hands touched hers. Sylvia had more reason for her fears than she had disclosed. Barstow came no more. There were no more cards, no more bets, and this change, taken together with Garrett Skinner's increased friendship, added to her apprehensions. She dreaded some new plot more sinister, more terrible, than that one of which she was aware. "'If only I knew!' she cried. "'Oh, if I only knew!' Archie Parmenter had paid one visit to the house, had stayed for one night, and he and Garrett Skinner and Walter Hine had sat up till morning, talking together in the library. Sylvia, waking up from a fitful sleep, had heard their voices again and again through the dark hours, and when the dawn was grey she had heard them coming up to bed, as on the first night of her return, and as on that night there was one who stumbled heavily. It was since that night that terror had distracted her. "'I have no longer any power,' she said. "'Something has happened to destroy my power. I have no longer any influence.' Something was done upon that night and she shivered as though she guessed, and she looked at her clenched hand as though the clue lay hidden in its palm. There lay her great trouble. She had lost her influence over Walter Hine. She had knowledge of the underside of life, yes, but her father had a greater knowledge still. He had used his greater knowledge. Craftily, and with a most ingenious subtlety, he had destroyed her power, he had blunted her weapons. Hine was attracted by Sylvia, fascinated by her charm, her looks, and the gentle simplicity of her manner. Very well. On the other side, Garrett Skinner had held out a lure of greater attractions, greater fascination, and Sylvia was powerless. "'He has changed,' Sylvia went on, with her eyes fixed on Walter Hine. "'Oh, not merely toward me. He has changed physically. Can you understand? He has grown nervous, restless, excitable, a thing of twitching limbs. Oh, and that's not all. I will tell you. This morning it seemed to me that the color of his eyes had changed.' Jane stared at her. "'Sylvia!' he exclaimed. "'Oh, I have not lost my senses,' she answered, and she resumed. I only noticed that there was an alteration at first. I did not see in what the alteration lay. Then I saw. His eyes used to be light in color. This morning they were dark. I looked carefully to make sure, and so I understood. The pupils of his eyes were so dilated that they covered the whole eyeball. Can you think why? And even as she asked, she looked at that clenched hand of hers, as though the answer to that question as well lay hidden there. I am afraid, she said once more and upon that chain committed the worst of the many indiscretions which had signalized his courtship. "'You are afraid? Sylvia, then let me take you away.' At once Sylvia drew back. Had Chain not spoken, she would have told him all that there was to tell. She was in the mood at this unguarded moment. She would have told him that during those last days Walter Hine had taken to drink once more. She would have opened that clenched fist and showed the thing it hid, even though the thing condemned her father beyond all hope of exculpation. But Chain had checked her as surely as though he had laid the palm of his hand upon her lips. He would talk of love and flight, and of neither had she any wish to hear. She craved with a great yearning for sympathy and a little kindness. But Chain was not content to offer what she needed. He would add more, and what he added marred the whole gift for Sylvia. She shook her head, and looking at him with a sad and gentle smile, said, "'Love is for happy people.' "'That is a hard saying, Sylvia,' Chain returned, "'and not a true one.' "'True to me,' said Sylvia, with a deep conviction, and as he advanced to her she raised her hand to keep him off. "'No, no,' she cried, and had he listened he might have heard a hint of exasperation in her voice. But he would not be warned." You can't go on living here without sympathy, without love, without even kindness. Already it is evident. You are ill and tired. And you think to go on all your life or all your father's life. Sylvia, let me take you away. And each unwise word set him further and further from his aim. It seemed to her that there was no help anywhere. Chain in front of her seemed to her almost as much her enemy as her father, who paced the lawn behind her arm in arm with Walter Hine. She clasped her hands together with a quick, sharp movement. "'I will not let you take me away,' she cried, "'for I do not love you. 
and her voice had lost its gentleness and grown cold and hard. Chayne began again, but whether it was with the renewal of his plea, she did not hear, for she broke in upon him quickly. "'Please, let me finish. I am, as you said, a little overwrought. Just hear me out and leave me to bear my troubles by myself. You will make it easier for me.' She saw that the words hurt her lover, but she did not modify them. She was in the mood to hurt. She had been betrayed by her need of sympathy into speaking words which she would gladly have recalled. She had been caught off her guard and almost unawares, and she resented it. Chayne had told her that she looked ill and tired, and she resented that, too. No wonder she looked tired when she had her father with his secret treacheries on one side and an importunate lover on the other. She thought for a moment or two how best to put what she still had to say. "'I have probably said to you,' she resumed, "'more than was right or fair, I mean fair to my father. I have no doubt exaggerated things. I want you to forget what I have said, for it led you into a mistake.' Chayne looked at her in perplexity. A mistake? Yes, she answered. She was standing in front of him with her forehead wrinkled and a sombre, angry look in her eyes. A mistake which I must correct. You said that I was living here without kindness. It is not true. My father is kind. And as Chayne raised his eyes in a mute protest, she insisted on the word. Yes, kind and thoughtful, thoughtful for others besides myself. A kind of obstinacy forced her to enlarge upon the topic. I can give you an instance which will surprise you. There is no need, Chayne said gently, but Sylvia was implacable. But there is need, she returned. I beg you to hear me. When my father and I were at Weymouth, we drove one afternoon across the neck of the Chesil Beach to Portland. Chayne looked at Sylvia quickly. Yes, he said, and there was an indefinable change in his voice. He had consented to listen because she wished it. Now he listened with a keen attention, for a strange thought had crept into his mind. We drove up the hill toward the plateau at the top of the island, but as we passed through the village, Fortune's Well, I think they call it, my father stopped the carriage at a tobacconist's and went into the shop. He came out again with some plugs of tobacco, a good many, and got into the carriage. You won't guess why he bought them. I didn't. Well, said Chayne, and now he spoke with suspense. Suspense, too, was visible in his quiet attitude. There was a mystery which for Sylvia's sake he wished to unravel. Why did Gabriel Strood now call himself Garrett Skinner? That was the mystery. But he must unravel it without doing any hurt to Sylvia. He could not go too warily. Of that he had been sure, ever since Kenyon had refused to speak of it. There might be some hidden thing which for Sylvia's sake must not be brought to light. Therefore he must find out the truth without help from any one. He wondered whether unconsciously Sylvia herself was going to give him the clue. Was she to tell him what she did not know herself, why Gabriel Strood was now Garrett Skinner? Well, he repeated. As we continued up the hill, she resumed, my father cut up the tobacco into small pieces with his pocket-knife. "'Why are you doing that?' I asked, and he laughed and said, "'Wait, you will see.' At the top of the hill we got out of the carriage and walked across the open plateau. In front of us, rising high above a little village, stood out a hideous white building. My father asked if I knew what it was. I said I guessed. "'It was the prison,' Chain interrupted quickly. "'Yes.' "'You went to it?' Upon the answer to the question depended whether or no Chain was to unravel his mystery to-day. No, replied Sylvia, and Chain drew a breath. Had she answered yes, the suspicion which had formed within his mind must needs be set aside, as clearly and finally disproved. Since she had answered no, the suspicion gathered strength. We went, however, near to it. We went as close to it as the quarries. It was five o'clock in the afternoon, and as we came to the corner of the wall which surrounds the quarries, my father said, They have stopped work now. He knew that? asked Chayne. Yes, we turned into a street which runs down toward the prison. On one side are small houses, on the other the long wall of the government quarries. The street was empty, only now and then, very seldom, someone passed along it. 
On the top of the wall there were sentry-boxes built at intervals for the warders to overlook the convicts. But these were empty, too. The wall is not high. I suppose, in fact my father said, the quarry was deep on the other side. Yes, said Chayne quietly, and then? Then we walked slowly along the street, and whenever there was no one near, my father threw some tobacco over the wall. I don't suppose they have a very enjoyable time, he said. They will be glad to find the tobacco there tomorrow. We walked up the street and turned and came back, and when we reached the corner he said with a laugh, That's all, Sylvia. My pockets are empty. We walked back to the carriage and drove home again to Weymouth. Sylvia had finished her story, and the mystery was clear to Chayne. She had told him the secret which she did not know herself. He was sure now why Gabriel Strood had changed his name. He knew now why Gabriel Strood no longer climbed the Alps, and why Kenyon would answer no question as to the disappearance of his friend. "'I have told you this,' said Sylvia, "'because you accused my father of unkindness and want of thought. Would you have thought of those poor prisoners over there in the quarries? If you had, would you have taken so much trouble just to give them a small luxury?' I think they must have blessed the unknown man who thought for them, and showed them what so many want, a little sympathy and a little kindness. Chayne bowed his head. Yes, he said gently, I was unjust. Indeed, even to himself he acknowledged that Garrett Skinner had shown an unexpected kindness, although he was sure of the reason for the act. He had no doubt that Garrett Skinner had labored in those quarries himself, and perhaps had himself picked up in bygone days, as he stooped over his work, tobacco thrown over the walls by some more fortunate man. "'I am glad you acknowledge that,' said Sylvia, but her voice did not relent from its hostility. She stood without further word, expecting him to take his leave. Chayne recollected with how hopeful a spirit he had travelled down from London. His fine diplomacy had, after all, availed him little. He had gained certainly some unexpected knowledge, which convinced him still more thoroughly that the sooner he took Sylvia away from her father and his friends, the better it would be. But he was no nearer to his desire. It might be that he was further off than ever. "'You are returning to London?' she asked. "'Yes. I have to call at the war office to-morrow.' Sylvia had no curiosity as to that visit. She took no interest in it whatever, he noticed with a pang. And then, she asked slowly, as she crossed the hall with him to the door, You will go home? Chayne smiled rather bitterly. Yes, I suppose so. Into Sussex? Yes. She opened the door, and as he came out onto the steps, she looked at him with a thoughtful scrutiny for a few moments. But whether her thoughts portended good or ill for him, he could not tell. When I was a boy, he said abruptly, I used to see from the garden of my house, far away in a dip of the downs, a dark high wall standing up against the sky. I never troubled myself as to how it came to have been built there. But I used to wonder, being a boy, whether it could be scaled or no. One afternoon I rode my pony over to find out, and I discovered, what do you think, that my wall was a mere hedge, just three feet high, no more. Well, said Sylvia. Well, I have not forgotten, that's all, he replied. Goodbye, she said, and he learned no more from her voice than he had done from her looks. He walked away down the lane, and having gone a few yards, he looked back. Sylvia was still standing in the doorway, watching him with grave and thoughtful eyes. But there was no invitation to him to return and turning away again, he walked on. Sylvia went upstairs to her room. She unclenched her hand at last. In its palm there lay a little phial containing a colorless solution. But there was a label upon the phial, and on the label was written, Cocaine. It was that which had struck at her influence over Walter Hine. It was to introduce this drug that Archie Parmenter had been brought down from London and the West End clubs. "'It's drunk a good deal in a quiet way,' Archie had said, as he made a pretense himself to drink it. "'You leave such drugs to the aristocracy, Walter,' Garrett Skinner had chimed in. "'Just a taste, if you like, but go gently.' 
Sylvia had not been present, but she conjectured the scene, and her conjecture was not far from the truth. But why, she asked, and again fear took hold of her, what was to be gained? There were limits to Sylvia's knowledge of the underside of life. She did not guess. She turned to her mirror and looked at herself. Yes, she looked tired, she looked ill, but she was not grateful for having the fact pointed out to her. And while she still looked, she heard her father's voice calling her. She shivered as though her fear once more laid hold on her. Then she locked the bottle of cocaine away in a drawer and ran lightly down the stairs. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of Running Water by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Both Sides of the Question Chain's house stood high upon a slope of the Sussex Downs. Built of stone two centuries ago, it seemed gradually to have taken on the brown color of the hill behind it, subduing itself to the general scheme, even as birds and animals will do so that strangers who searched for it in the valley discovered it by the upward swirl of smoke from its wide chimneys. On its western side, and just beneath the house, there was a cleft in the downs through which the high road ran, and in the cleft the houses of a tiny village clustered even as at the foot of some old castle in Picardy. On the east, the great ridge with its shadow-holding hollows, its rounded, gorse-strewn slopes of grass, rolled away for ten miles, and then dipped suddenly to the banks of the river Arran. The house faced south, and from its high terraced garden a great stretch of park and forest land was visible, where amidst the green and russet of elm and beech a cluster of yews set here and there gave the illusion of a black and empty space. Beyond the forest land a lower ridge of hills rose up, and over that ridge one saw the spires of Chichester and the level flats of Selsey reaching to the sea. Into this garden Chain came on the next afternoon, and as he walked along its paths alone, he could almost fancy that his dead father paced with the help of his stick at his side, talking, as had been his wont, of this or that improvement needed by the farms, pointing out to him a meadow in the hollow beneath which might soon be coming into the market, and always ending up with the same plea. Isn't it time, Hilary, that you married and came home to look after it all yourself? Chain had turned a deaf ear to that plea, but it made its appeal to him to-night. Wherever his eyes rested, he recaptured something of his boyhood. The countryside was alive with memories. He looked south and remembered how the perished cities of history had acquired reality for him by taking on the aspect of Chichester lying low there on the flats and how the spires of the fabled towns of his story-books had caught the light of the setting sun, just as did now the towers of the cathedral. Eastward, in the dip between the shoulder of the downs and the trees of Arundel Park, a long black hedge stood out with a remarkable definition against the sky, the hedge of which he had spoken to Sylvia, the great dark wall of brambles guarding the precincts of the sleeping beauty. He recalled the adventurous day when he had first ridden alone upon his pony along the great back of the downs, and had come down to it through a sylvan country of silence and ferns and open spaces, and had discovered it to be no more than a hedge waist-high. The dusk came upon him as he loitered in that solitary garden, the light shone out in cottage and farmhouse, and more closely still his memories crowded about him weaving spells. Someone to share them with! Chain had no need to wait for old age before he learned the wisdom of Michel Revailloux, for his heart leaped now as he dreamed of exploring once more with Sylvia at his side the enchanted country of his boyhood, gallops in the quiet summer mornings along that still visible track across the downs by which the Roman legions had marched in the old days from London straight as a die to Chichester. Winter days with the hounds, a rush on windy afternoons, in a sloop-rigged boat down the Arran to Littlehampton. Chain's heart leaped with a passionate longing as he dreamed, and sank as he turned again to the blank windows of the empty house. He dined alone, and while he dined evoked Sylvia's presence at the table, 
setting her not at the far end, but at the side and close, so that a hand might now and then touch hers, calling up into her face her slow, hesitating smile, seeing her still grey eyes grow tender, in a word watching the Madonna change into the woman. He went into the library, where, since the night had grown chilly, a fire was lit. It was a place of comfort, with high bookshelves, deep cushioned chairs, and dark curtains. But, no less than the dining-room, it needed another presence, and lacking that, lacked everything. It needed the girl with the tired and terror-haunted face. Here, surely, the fear would die out of her soul. The eyes would lose their shadows. The feet regain the lightness of their step. Chayne took down his favourite books, but they failed him. Between the pages and his eyes one face would shape itself. He looked into the fire, and sought as of old, to picture in the flame some mountain on which his hopes were set, and to discover the right line for its ascent. But even that pastime brought no solace for his discontent. The house oppressed him. It was empty. It was silent. He drew aside the curtains, and looking down into the valley through the clear night air, watched the lights in cottage and farm, with the envy born of his loneliness. In spite of the brave words he had used, he wondered to-night whether the three-foot hedge was not, after all, to prove the unassailable wall. And it was important that he should know, for if it were so, why then had he not called at the war office in vain? A proposal had been made to him, that he should join a commission for the delimitation of a distant frontier. A year's work, and an immediate departure, those were the conditions. Within two days he must make up his mind, within ten days he must leave England. Chayne pondered over the decision which he must make. If he had lost Sylvia, here was the mission to accept, for it meant complete severance, a separation not to be measured by miles alone, but by the nature of the work and the comrades, and even the character of the vegetation. He went to bed in doubt, thinking that the morning might bring him counsel. It brought him a letter from Sylvia instead. The letter was long, it was written in haste, it was written in great distress, so that words which were rather unkind were written down. But the message of the letter was clear. Chayne was not to come again to the house of the running water, nor to the little house in London when she returned to it. They were not to meet again, she did not wish it. Chayne burnt the letter as soon as he had read it, taking no offence at the hasty words. "'I seem to have worried her more than I thought,' he said to himself, with a wistful smile. "'I am sorry.' And again as the sparks died out from the black ashes of the letter, he repeated, "'Poor little girl, I am very sorry.' So the house would always be silent and empty. Sylvia had written the letter in haste on the very evening of Chayne's visit and had hurried out to post it in fear, lest she might change her mind in the morning. But in the morning she was only aware of a great lightness of spirit. She could now devote herself to the work of her life, and for two long tiring days she kept Walter Hine at her side. But now he sought to avoid her. The little energy he had ever had was gone. He alternated between exhilaration and depression. He preferred, it seemed, to be left alone. For two days, however, Sylvia persevered, and on the third her lightness of spirit unaccountably deserted her. She drove with Walter Hine that morning, and something of his own irritability seemed to have passed into her, so that he turned to her and asked, "'What have I done? Aren't you pleased with me? Why are you angry?' "'I am not angry,' she replied, turning her great grey eyes upon him. "'But if you wish to know, I miss something.' So much she owned. She missed something, and she knew very well what it was that she missed. Even as Chayne in his Sussex home had ached to know that the house lacked a particular presence, so it began to be with Sylvia in Dorsetshire. Yet he has been absent for a longer time, she argued with herself, and I have not missed him. Indeed, I have been glad of his absence. And the answer came quickly from her thoughts. At any time you could have called him to your side, and you knew it. Now you have sent him away for always. During the week the sense of loss, the feeling that everything was unbearably incomplete, grew stronger and stronger within her. She had no heart for the losing battle in which she was engaged. 
A dangerous question began to force itself forward in her mind whenever her eyes rested upon Walter Hine. Was he worth while? she asked herself, though as yet she did not define all that the while connoted. The question was most prominent in her mind on the seventh day after the letter had been said. She had persuaded Walter Hine to mount with her onto the down behind the house. They came to the great white horse, and Hine, pleading fatigue, a plea which during these last days had been ever on his lips, flung himself down upon the grass. For a little time Sylvia sat idly, watching the great battleships at firing practice in the bay. It was an afternoon of August. A light haze hung in the still air, softening the distant promontories, and on the waveless, sparkling sea the great ships, coal-black to the eye, circled about the targets, with now and then a roar of thunder and a puff of smoke, like some monstrous engines of heat, heat stifling and oppressive. By sheer contrast, Sylvia began to dream of the cool glaciers, and the chalet de Lognan suddenly stood visible before her eyes. She watched the sunlight die off the red rocks of the Chardonnay, the evening come with silent feet across the snow, and the starlit night follow close upon its heels. Night fled as she dreamed. She saw the ice slope and the Aiguille d'Argentière. She could almost hear the chip-chip of the axes as the steps were cut, and the perpetual hiss as the ice fragments streamed down the slope. Then she looked toward Walter Hine, with the speculative inquiry which had come so often into her eyes of late, and as she looked she saw him furtively take from a pocket a tabloid or capsule, and slip it secretly into his mouth. "'How long have you been taking cocaine?' she asked suddenly. Walter Hine flushed scarlet, and turned to her with a shrinking look. "'I don't,' he stammered. Yet you left a bottle of the drug where I found it. That was not mine, said he, still more confused. That was Archie Parmenter's. He left it behind. Yes, said Sylvia, finding here a suspicion confirmed. But he left it for you? And if I did take it, said Hine, turning irritably to her, what can it matter to you? I believe that what your father says is true. What does he say? that you care for Captain Chain, and it's no use for anyone else to think of you. Sylvia started. Oh, he says that. She understood now one of the methods of the new intrigue. Sylvia was in love with Chain, therefore Walter Hine may console himself with cocaine. It was not Garrett Skinner who suggested it. Oh, no. But Archie Parmenter is invited for the night, takes the drug himself, or pretends to take it, praises it, describes how the use of it has grown in the West End and amongst the clubs, and then conveniently leaves the drug behind, and no doubt supplies it as it is required. Sylvia began to dilate upon its ill effects, and suddenly broke off. A great disgust was within her, and stopped her speech. She got to her feet. "'Let us go home,' she said, and she went very quickly down the hill. When she came to the house she ran upstairs to her room, locked the door, and flung herself upon the bed. Walter Hine, her father, their plots and intrigues were swept clean from her mind as of no account. Her struggle for the mastery became unimportant in her thoughts, a folly, a waste. For what her father had said was true, she cared for Chane, and what she herself had said to Chane, when first he came to the house of the running water, was no less true. If I loved, I think nothing else would count at all, except that I loved. She had judged herself aright. She knew that, as she lay prone upon her bed, plunged in misery, while the birds called upon the boughs in the garden, and the mill-stream filled the room with its leaping music. In a few minutes a servant knocked upon the door, and told her that tea was ready in the library, but she returned no answer. And in a few minutes more, or so it seemed, but meanwhile the dusk had come, there came another knock, and she was told that dinner had been served. But to that message again she returned no answer. The noises of the busy day ceased in the fields, the birds were hushed upon the branches, quiet and darkness took and refreshed the world. Only the throbbing music of the stream beat upon the ears, and beat with a louder significance, since all else was still. 
Sylvia lay staring wide-eyed into the darkness. To the murmur of this music, in perhaps this very room, she had been born. Why, she asked piteously, why? Of what use was it that she must suffer? Of all the bad hours of her life, these were the worst, for the yearning for happiness and love throbbed and cried at her heart, louder and louder, just as the music of the stream swelled to importance with the coming of the night and she learned that she had had both love and happiness within her grasp, and that she had thrown them away for a shadow. She thought of the letter which she had written, recalling its phrases with a sinking heart. "'No man could forgive them. I must have been mad,' she said, and she huddled herself upon her bed and wept aloud. She ran over in her mind the conversations which she and Hilary Chayne had exchanged, and each recollection accused her of impatience, and paid a tribute to his gentleness. On the very first day he had asked her to go with him, and her heart cried out now, Why didn't I go? He had been faithful and loyal ever since, and she had called his faithfulness importunity, and his loyalty a humiliation. She struck a match and looked at her watch, and by habit wound it up, and she drearily wondered on how many, many nights she would have to wind it up and speculate in ignorance what he, her lover, was doing, and in what corner of the world, before the end of her days was reached. What would become of her, she asked, and she raised the corner of a curtain and glanced at the bright picture of what might have been, and glancing at it, the demand for happiness raised her in revolt. She lit her candle and wrote another letter of the shortest. It contained but these few words. Oh, please forgive me. Come back and forgive. Oh, you must. Sylvia. And having written them, Sylvia stole quietly downstairs, let herself out of the door, and posted them. Two nights afterward she leaned out of her window at midnight, wondering whether by the morrow's post she would receive an answer to her message. And while she wondered, she understood that the answer would not come that way. For suddenly, in the moonlit road beneath her, she saw standing the one who was to send it. Chain had brought his answer himself. For a moment she distrusted her own eyes, believing that her thoughts had raised this phantom to delude her. But the figure in the road moved beneath her window, and she heard his voice call to her, Sylvia, Sylvia. End of chapter 18《Chapter Nineteen of Running Water by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Shadow in the Room. Sylvia raised her hand suddenly, enjoining silence, and turned back into the room. She had heard a door slam violently within the house, and now from the hall voices rose. Her father and Walter Hine were coming up early tonight from the library, and it seemed in anger. At all events, Walter Hine was angry. His voice rang up the stairway, shrill and violent. "'Why do you keep it from me? I will not have it, I tell you. I am not a child.' And an oath or two garnished the sentences. Sylvia heard her father reply with a patronage which never failed to sting the vanity of his companion, which was the surest means to provoke a quarrel, if a quarrel he desired. "'Go to bed, Wally. Leave such things to Archie Parmenter.' You are too young. His voice was friendly, but a little louder than he generally used, so that Sylvia clearly distinguished every word, so clearly, indeed, that had he wished her to hear, thus he would have spoken. She heard the two men mount the stairs, Hine still protesting with the violence which had grown on him of late, Garrett Skinner seeking apparently to calm him, and apparently oblivious that every word he spoke inflamed Walter Hine the more. She had a fear there would be blows, blows struck, of course, by Hine. She knew the reason of the quarrel. Her father was depriving Hine of his drug. They passed upstairs, however, and on the landing above she heard their doors close. Then, coming back to the window, she made a sign to chain, slipped a cloak about her shoulders, and stole quietly down the dark stairs to the door. She unlocked the door gently and went out to her lover. Upon the threshold she hesitated, chilled by a fear as to how he would greet her. But he turned to water, and in the moonlight she saw his face and read it. 
There was no anger there. She ran toward him. "'Oh, my dear!' she cried, in a low, trembling voice, and his arms enclosed her. As she felt them hold her to him, and knew indeed that it was he, her lover, whose lips bent down to hers, there broke from her a long sigh of such relief and such great uplifting happiness as comes but seldom, perhaps no more than once, in the life of any man or woman. Her voice sank to a whisper, and yet it was very clear, and to the man who heard it, sweet as never music was. "'Oh, my dear, my dear, you have come, then!' And she stroked his face, and her hands clung about his neck, to make very sure. "'Were you afraid I wouldn't come, Sylvia?' he asked with a low, quiet laugh. She lifted her face into the moonlight, so that he saw at once the tears bright in her eyes, and the smile trembling upon her lips. "'No,' she said, "'I rather thought that you would come.' And she laughed as she spoke. Or did she sob? He could hardly tell, so near she was to both. "'Oh, but I could not be sure. I wrote with so much unkindness.' And her eyes dropped from his in shame. "'Hush,' he said, and he held her close. "'Have you forgiven me? Oh, please forgive me!' "'Long since,' said he. But Sylvia was not reassured. "'Ah, but you won't forget,' she said ruefully. "'One can forgive, but one can't forget what one forgives.' And then, since even in her remorse hope was uppermost with her that night, she cried, "'Oh, Hilary, do you think you will ever forget what I wrote to you?' And again Chayne laughed quietly at her fears. "'What does it matter what you wrote a week ago, since to-night we are here, you and I, together in the moonlight, for all the world to see that we are lovers?' She drew him quickly aside into the shadow of the wall. "'Are you afraid we should be seen?' he asked. "'No, but afraid that we may be interrupted,' she replied, with a clear trill of laughter, which showed to her lover that her fears had passed. "'The whole village is asleep, Sylvia,' he said in a whisper, and as he spoke a blind was lifted in an upper story of the house, a window was flung wide, and the light streamed out from it into the moonlit air and spread over their heads like a great yellow fan. Walter Hine leaned his elbows on the sill and looked out. Sylvia moved deeper into the shadow. "'He cannot see us,' said Chayne, with a smile, and he set his arm about her waist, and so they stood very quietly. The house was built a few yards back from the road, and on each side of it the high wall of the garden curved toward it, making thus an open gravel space in front of its windows. Sylvia and her lover stood at one of the corners where the wall curved in. The shadow reached out beyond their feet, and lay upon the white road in a black triangle. They could hardly be seen from any window of the house, and certainly they could not be recognized. But on the other hand they could see. From behind Walter Hine the light streamed out clear, the ceiling of the room was visible, and the shadow of the lamp upon it, and even the top part of the door in the far corner. "'We will wait until he turns back into the room,' Sylvia whispered, and for a little while they stood and watched. Then she felt Chayne's arm tighten about her and hold her still. "'Do you see?' he cried in a low, quick voice. "'Sylvia, do you see?' "'What?' "'The door. Look, behind him, the door.' And Sylvia, looking as he bade her, started, and barely stifled the cry which rose to her lips. For behind Walter Hine, the door in the far corner of the room was opening, very slowly, very stealthily, as though the hand which opened it feared to be detected. So noiselessly had the latch been loosed that Walter Hine did not so much as turn his head. Nor did he turn it now. He heard nothing. He leaned from the window with his elbows on the sill, and behind him the gap between the door and the wall grew wider and wider. The door opened into the room and toward the window, so that the two people in the shadow below could see nothing of the intruder. But the secrecy of his coming had something sinister and most alarming. Sylvia joined her hands above her lover's arm, holding her breath. "'Shout to him,' she whispered. "'Cry out that there's danger.' "'Not yet,' said Chayne, with his eyes fixed upon the lighted room. And then, in spite of herself, a low and startled cry broke from Sylvia's lips. 
A great shadow had been suddenly flung upon the ceiling of the room, the shadow of a man bloated and made monstrous by the light. The intruder had entered the room, and with so much stealth that his presence was only noticed by the two who watched in the road below. But even they could not see who the intruder was. They only saw the shadow on the ceiling. Walter Hine, however, heard Sylvia's cry, faint though it was. He leaned forward from the window and peered down. Now, said Sylvia, now. But Chayne did not answer. He was watching with an extraordinary suspense. He seemed not to hear. And on the ceiling the shadow moved and changed its shape, now dwindling, now growing larger again, now disappearing altogether as though the intruder stooped below the level of the lamp. And once there was flung on the white plaster the huge image of an arm which had something in its hand. Was the arm poised above the lamp on the point of smashing it with the thing it held? Chayne waited, with a cry upon his lips, expecting each moment that the room would be plunged in darkness. But the cry was not uttered. The arm was withdrawn. It had not been raised to smash the lamp. The thing which the hand held was for some other purpose. And once more the shadow appeared, moving and changing as the intruder crept nearer to the window. Sylvia stood motionless. She had thought to cry out. Now she was fascinated. A spell of terror constrained her to silence. And then suddenly, behind Walter Hine, there stood out clearly in the light the head and shoulders of Garrett Skinner. "'My father,' said Sylvia in relief. Her clasp upon Chayne's arm relaxed. Her terror passed from her. In the revulsion of her feelings she laughed quietly at her past fear. Chayne looked quickly and curiously at her. Then as quickly he looked again to the window. Both men in the room were now lit up by the yellow light. Their attitudes, their figures were very clear but small, like marionettes upon the stage of some tiny theatre. Chayne watched them with no less suspense, now that he knew who the intruder was. Unlike Sylvia, he had betrayed no surprise when he had seen Garrett Skinner's head and shoulders rise into view behind Walter Hine, and unlike Sylvia, he did not relax his vigilance. Suddenly Garrett Skinner stepped forward, very quickly, very silently. With one step he was close behind his friend, and then just as he was about to move again, it seemed to Sylvia that he was raising his arm, perhaps to touch his friend upon the shoulder. Chayne whistled whistled sharply, shrilly, and with a kind of urgency which Sylvia did not understand. Walter Hine leaned forward out of the window. That was quite natural. But on the other hand, Garrett Skinner did nothing of the kind. To Sylvia's surprise, he stepped back, and almost out of sight. Very likely he thought that he was out of sight. But to the watchers in the road, his head was just visible. He was peering over Walter Hine's shoulder. Again Chayne whistled, and not content with whistling, he cried out in a feigned, bucolic accent, "'I see you!' At once Garrett Skinner's head disappeared altogether. Walter Hine peered down into the darkness whence the whistle came, curving his hands above his forehead to shut out the light behind him, and behind him once more the shadow appeared upon the ceiling and the wall. A third time Chayne whistled, and Walter Hine cried out, what is it? And behind him the shadow vanished from the ceiling, and the door began to close softly and stealthily, just as softly and stealthily as it had been opened. Again Hine cried out, Who's there? What is it? And Chayne laughed aloud, derisively, as though he was some yokel practicing a joke. Hine turned back into the room. The room was empty, but the door was unlatched. He disappeared from the window, and the watchers below saw the door slam too, heard the sound of the slamming, and then another sound, the sound of a key turning in the lock. It seemed almost that Chayne had been listening for that sound, for he turned at once to Sylvia. We puzzled them fairly, didn't we? he said with a smile. But the smile somehow seemed hardly real, and his face was very white. It's the moonlight, he explained. Come. They walked quietly through the silent village, where the thick eaves of the cottages threw their black shadows on the white moonlit road, past the mill and the running water, to a gate which opened on the down. 
They unlatched the gate noiselessly and climbed the bare slope of grass. Halfway up, Chayne turned and looked down upon the house. There was no longer any light in any window. He turned to Sylvia and slipped his arm through hers. "'Come close,' said he, and now there was no doubt the smile was real. "'Shall we keep step, do you think?' "'If we go always like this, we might,' said Sylvia, with a smile. "'At times there will be a step to be cut, no doubt,' said he. "'You once said that I could stand firm while the step was being cut,' she answered. "'Always at the back of both their minds, evident from time to time in some such phrase as this, was the thought of the mountain upon which their friendship had been sealed. Friendship had become love here in the quiet Dorsetshire village, but in both their thoughts it had another background, ice slope and rock spire, and the bright sun over all. End of chapter 19。Chapter 20 of Running Water by A. E. W. Mason。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。On the Down。Sylvia led the way to a little hollow just beneath the ridge of the downs, a sheltered spot open to the sea. On the three other sides bushes grew about it, and dry branches and leaves deeply carpeted the floor. Here they rested and were silent. Upon Sylvia's troubled heart there had fallen a mantle of deep peace. The strife, the fears, the torturing questions had become dim like the small griefs of childhood. Even the incident of the lighted window vexed her not at all. Hilary, she said softly, lingering on the name, since to frame it and utter it and hear her lips speaking it greatly pleased her. Hilary. And her hand sought his, and finding it, she was content. It was a warm night of August. Overhead the moon sailed in a cloudless summer sky, drowning the stars. To the right, far below, the lamps of Weymouth curved about the shore, and in front the great bay shimmered like a jewel. Seven miles across it the massive bluff of Portland pushed into the sea, and even those rugged cliffs were subdued to the beauty of the night. Beneath them the riding light shone steady upon the masts of the battleships. Sylvia looked out upon the scene with an overflowing heart. Often she had gazed on it before, and she marveled now how quickly she had turned aside. Her eyes were now susceptible to beauty as they never had been. There was a glory upon land and sea, a throbbing tenderness in the warm air, of which she had not known until now. It seemed to her that she had lived until this night in a prison. Once the doors had been set ajar for a little while, just for a night and a day in the quiet of the high Alps. But only now had they been opened wide. Only to-night had she passed through and looked forth with an unhindered vision upon the world, and she discovered it to be a place of wonders and sweet magic. They were true, then, she said with a smile on her lips. Of what do you speak? asked Chayne. My dreams, Sylvia answered, knowing that she was justified of them, for I have come awake into the land of my dreams, and I know it at last to be a real land, even to the sound of running water. For from the hollow at her feet the music of the mill-stream rose to her ears through the still night, very clear and with a murmur of laughter. Sylvia looked down toward it. She saw it flashing like a ribbon of silver in the garden of the dark, quiet house. There was no breath of wind in that garden, and all the great trees were still. She saw the intricate pattern of their boughs traced upon the lawn in black and silver. "'In that house I was born,' she said softly to the noise of that stream. I am very glad to know that in that house, too, my great happiness has come to me." Chayne leaned forward, and sitting side by side with Sylvia, gazed down upon it with rapture. Oh, wonderful house where Sylvia was born! How much the world owed to it! It was there, he said with awe. Yes, replied Sylvia. She was not without a proper opinion of herself and it seemed rather a wonderful house to her, too. Perhaps on some such night as this, he said, and at once took the words back. No, you were born on a sunny morning of July, and the blackbirds on the branches told the good news to the blackbirds on the lawn, and the stream took up the message and rippled it out to the ships upon the sea, 
There were no wrecks that day. Sylvia turned to him, her face made tender by a smile, her dark eyes kind and bright. Hilary, she whispered, oh, Hilary. Sylvia, he replied, mimicking her tone, and Sylvia laughed with a clear melodious note of happiness. All her old life was whirled away upon those notes of laughter. She leaned to her lover with a sigh of contentment, her hair softly touching his cheek her eyes once more dropped to the still garden and the dark square house at the down's foot. "'There you ask me to marry you, to go away with you,' she said, and she caught his hand and held it close against her breast. "'Yes, there I first asked you,' he said, and some distress, forgotten in these first perfect moments, suddenly found voice. "'Sylvia, why didn't you come with me then? Oh, my dear, if you only had!' But Sylvia's happiness was as yet too fresh, too loud at her throbbing heart for her to mark the jarring note. "'I did not want to then,' she replied lightly, and then tightening her clasp upon his hand. "'But now I do. Oh, Hilary, I do. If only you had wanted then!' Though he spoke low, the anguish of his voice was past mistaking. Sylvia looked at him quickly and most anxiously, and as quickly she looked away. Oh, no, she whispered hurriedly. Her happiness could not be so short-lived a thing. Her heart stood still at the thought. It could not be that she had set foot actually within the dreamland to be forthwith cast out again. She thought of the last week, its aching lonely hours. She needed her lover at her side, longed for him with a great yearning, and would not let him go. I'll not listen, Hilary, she said stubbornly. I will not hear, no and Chain drew her close to his side. "'There is bad news, Sylvia.' The outcry died away upon her lips. The words crushed the rebellion in her heart. They were so familiar. It seemed to her that all her life bad news had been brought to her by every messenger. She shivered and was silent, looking straight out across the moonlit sea. Then, in a small trembling voice like a child, she pleaded, still holding her face averted. Don't go away from me, Hilary. Oh, please, don't go away from me now. Her voice, her words, went to Chain's heart. He knew that pride and a certain reticence were her natural qualities, that she should throw aside the one, break through the other, prove to him, indeed, how very much she cared, how very much she needed him. Sylvia, he cried, it will only be for a little while. And again silence followed upon his words. Since bad news was to be imparted, strength was needed to bear it, and habit had long since taught Sylvia that silence was the best nurse of strength. She did not turn her face toward her lover, but she drooped her head and clenched her hands tightly together upon her knees, nerving herself for the blow. The movement, slight though it was, stirred chain to pity and hurt him with an intolerable pain. It betrayed so unmistakably the long habit of suffering. She sat silent, motionless, with the dumb patience of a wounded animal. "'Oh, Sylvia, why did you not come with me that first day?' he cried. "'Tell me your bad news, dear,' she replied gently. "'I cannot help it,' he began in broken tones. "'Sylvia, you will see that there is no escape, that I must go. An appointment was offered to me, by the war office. It was offered to me, pressed on me, the day after I last came here, the day after we were together in the library. I did not know what to do. I did not accept it. But it seemed to me that each time I came to see you, we became more and more estranged. I was given two days to make up my mind, and within the two days, my dear, your letter came telling me that you did not wish to see me any more. Oh, Hilary, she whispered. I accepted the appointment at once. There were reasons why I welcomed it. It would take me abroad. Abroad, she cried. Yes, I welcomed that, to be near you and not to see you, to be near you and know that others were talking with you, any one, every one except me, to be near you and know that you were unhappy and in trouble, and that I could not even tell you how deeply I was sorry. I dreaded that, Sylvia. And yet I dreaded one thing more. Here, in England, at each turn of the street, I should think to come upon you suddenly to pass you as a stranger, or almost as a stranger. No, I could not do it. Oh, Hilary, she whispered, 
and lifting his hand she laid it against her cheek. So for a week I was glad, but this morning I received your second letter, Sylvia. It came too late, my dear. There was no time to obtain a substitute. Sylvia turned to him with a startled face. When do you go? Very soon. When? The words had to be spoken. Tomorrow morning I catch the first train from Weymouth to Southampton. We sail from Southampton at noon. Habit came again to her assistance. She turned away from him so that he might not see her face, and he went on. Had there been more time, I could have made arrangements. Someone else could have gone. As it is, he broke off suddenly, and bending toward her, cried, Sylvia, say I must go. But she could not bring herself to that. She was minded to hold with both hands the good thing which had come to her this night. She shook her head. He sought to turn her face to his, but she looked stubbornly away. And when will you return? she asked. In a few months, Sylvia. When? In June. And she counted off the months upon her fingers. So after tonight, she said in a low voice, I shall not see you any more for all these months. The winter must pass, and the spring too. Oh, Hilary! And she turned to him with a quivering face, and whispered piteously, Don't go, my dear, don't go. Say that I must go, he insisted, and she laughed with scorn. Then the laughter ceased, and she said, There will be danger? None, he cried. Yes, from sickness, and— her voice broke in a sob. I shall not be near. I will take great care, Sylvia, be sure of that, he answered. Now that I have you, I will take great care. And leaning toward her, as she sat with her hands clasped upon her knees, he touched her hair with his lips very tenderly. Oh, Hilary, what will I do? Till you come back to me, what will I do? I have thought of it, Sylvia. I thought this. It might be better if for these months— they will not pass quickly, my dear, either for you or me. They will be long, slow months for both of us. That's the truth, my dear. But since they must be got through, I thought it might be better if you went back to your mother. Sylvia shook her head. It would be better, he urged, with a look toward the house. I can't do that. Afterward, in a year's time, when we are together, I should like very much for us both to go to her. But my mother forbade it when I went away from Chamonix. I was not to come whining back to her. Those were her words. We parted altogether that night. She spoke with an extreme simplicity. There was neither an appeal for pity nor a hint of any bitterness in her voice. But the words moved Chain all the more on that account. He would be leaving a very lonely, friendless girl to battle through the months of his absence by herself. And to battle with what? He was not sure. But he had not taken so lightly the shadow on the ceiling and the opening door. "'If only you had come with me on that first day!' he cried. "'I will have to-night to look back upon, my dear,' she said. "'That will be something. Oh, if I had not asked you to come back! If you had gone away and said nothing, what would I have done then? As it is, I will know that you are thinking of me.' And suddenly she turned to him, and held him away from her in a spasm of fear, while her eyes searched his face. But in a moment they melted, and a smile made her lips beautiful. "'Oh, yes, I can trust you,' she said, and she nestled against him contentedly like a child. For a little while they sat thus, and then her eyes sought the garden and the house at her feet. It seemed that the sinister plot was not, after all, to develop in that place of quiet, an old peace without her for its witness. It seemed that she was to be kept by some fatality close fettered to the task, the hopeless task which she would now gladly have foregone, and she wondered whether, after all, she was in some way meant to watch the plot, perhaps, after all, to hinder it. Hilary, she said, do you remember that evening at the Chalet de Lognan? Do I remember it? You explained to me a law that those who know must use their knowledge, if by using it they can save a soul, or save a life. Yes, he said vaguely, remembering that he had spoken in this strain. Well, I have been trying to obey that law. Do you understand? I want you to understand. For when I have been unkind, as I have been many times, it was, I think, because I was not obeying it with very much success. And I should like you to believe and know that. 
for when you are away you will remember in spite of yourself the times when I was bitter. Her words made clear to him many things which had perplexed him during these last weeks. Her friendship for Walter Hine became intelligible, and as though to leave him no shadow of doubt, she went on. You see, I knew the underside of things, and I seemed to see the opportunity to use the knowledge. So I tried to save, and whether it was life or soul or both she did not say. She did not add that so far she had tried in vain. She did not mention the bottle of cocaine, or the dread which of late had so oppressed her. She was careful of her lover. Since he had to go, since he needs must be absent, she would spare him anxieties and dark thoughts, which he could do nothing to dispel. But even so he obtained a clearer insight into the distress which she had suffered in that house, and the bravery with which she had borne it. Sylvia, he said, I had no thought, no wish, than what I said should stay with you. Yet it did, she answered, and I was thankful. I am thankful even now, for though I would gladly give up all the struggle now if I had you instead, since I have not you, I am thankful for the law. It was your voice which spoke it. It came from you. It will keep you near to me all through the black months until you come back. Oh, Hilary! and the brave argument spoken to enhearten herself and him ended suddenly in a most wistful cry. Chayne caught her to him. Oh, Sylvia! and he added, the life is not yet saved. Perhaps I am given to the summer, she answered, and then, with a whimsical change of humour, she laughed tenderly. Oh, but I wish I hadn't. You will write. Letters will come from you. As often as possible, my dear, but they won't come often. Let them be long, then, she whispered, very long, and she leaned her head against his shoulder. Lie close, my dear, said he, lie close. For a while longer they talked in low voices to one another, the words which lovers know and keep fragrant in their memories. The night, warm and clear, drew on toward morning, and the passage of the hours was unremarked. For both of them there was a glory upon the moonlit land and sea, which made of it a new world, and into this new world both walked for the first time, walked in their youth and hand in hand. Each for the first time knew the double pride of loving and being loved. In spite of their troubles they were not to be pitied, and they knew it. The grey morning light flooded the sky, and turned the moon into a pale white disk. "'Lie close, my dear,' said he. It is not time. In the trees in the garden below the blackbirds began to bustle amongst the leaves, and all at once their clear sweet music thrilled upward to the lovers in the hollow of the down. Lie close, my dear, he repeated. They watched the sun leap into the heavens and flash down the channel in golden light. The night is gone, said Chayne. Nothing can take it from us while we live answered Sylvia very softly. She raised herself from her couch of leaves. Then from one of the cottages in the tiny village a blue coil of smoke rose into the air. It is time, said Chayne, and they rose and hand in hand walked down the slope of the hill to the house. Sylvia unlatched the door noiselessly and went in. Chayne stepped in after her, and in the silent hall they took farewell of one another. Good-bye, my dear, she whispered, with the tears in her eyes and in her voice, and she clung to him a little, and so let him go. She held the door ajar until the sound of his footsteps had died away, and after that, for she fancied that she heard them still, since she so deeply wished to hear them. Then, with a breaking heart, she went up the stairs to her room. End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of Running Water by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chain comes to conclusions. Six weeks ago, I said goodbye to the French Commission on the borders of a great lake in Africa. A month ago, I was still walking to the railhead through the tangle of a forest's undergrowth, said Chain, and he looked about the little restaurant in King Street, St. James, as though to make sure that the words he spoke were true. 
The bright lights, the red benches against the walls, the women in their delicate gowns of lace, and the jingle of harness in the streets without, made their appeal to one who for the best part of a year had lived within the dark walls of a forest. June had come round again, and Sylvia sat at his side. "'You shall tell me how these months have gone with you while we dine,' said he. "'Your letters told me nothing of your troubles.' "'I did not mean them to,' replied Sylvia. "'I guessed that, my dear. It was like you. Yet I would rather have known.' Only a few hours before he had stood upon the deck of the channel packet, and had seen the bow swing westward of Dover Castle, and head toward the pier. Would Sylvia be there, he had wondered, as he watched the cluster of atoms on the quay, and in a little while he had seen her, standing quite alone, at the very end of the breakwater, that she might catch the first glimpse of her lover. Others had travelled with them in the carriage to London, and there had been no opportunity of speech. All that he knew was that she had been alone now for some weeks in the little house in Hobart Place. "'One thing I see,' he said, you are not as troubled as you were. The look of fear, that has gone from your eyes. Sylvia, I am glad. There were times, she answered, and as she thought upon them, terror once more leapt into her face. Times when I feared more than ever, when I needed you very much. But they are past now, Hilary. And her hand dropped for a moment upon his, and her eyes brightened with a smile. As they dined, she told the story of those months. We returned to London very suddenly after you had gone away, she began. We were to have stayed through September, but my father said that business called him back, and I noticed that he was deeply troubled. When did you notice that? asked Chayne quickly. When did you first notice it? Sylvia reflected for a moment. The day after you had gone. Are you sure? asked Chayne, with a certain intensity. Quite. Chayne nodded his head. I did not understand the reason of the hurry, and I was perplexed and also a little alarmed. Everything which I did not understand frightened me in those days. She spoke as if those days, and all their dark events, belonged to some dim period, of which no consequence could reach her now. Our departure had almost the look of a flight. Yes, said Chayne. For his part, he was not surprised at their flight. He had passed more than one wakeful night during the last few months, arguing and arguing again whether or no he should have disclosed to Sylvia the meaning of that softly opening door and the shadow on the ceiling as he read it. He might have been wrong. If so, he would have added to Sylvia's burden of troubles yet another, and one more terrible than all the rest. He might have been right, and if so, he might have enabled Sylvia to avert a tragedy. Thus the argument had revolved in a circle, and left him always in the same doubt. Now he understood that his explanation of the incident had been confirmed. The loud whistle from the darkness of the road, the yokel's cry, which had driven Garrett Skinner from the room as noiselessly as he entered it, had done more than that. They had driven him from the neighborhood altogether. Someone had seen him, had seen him standing just behind Walter Hine in the lighted room, and on the next day he had fled. I was right, he said absently, right to keep silent. For here was Sylvia at his side, and the dreaded peril unfulfilled. Well, you return to London, he added hastily. Yes, there is something of which I did not tell you that night when we were together on the downs. Walter Hine had begun to take cocaine. Chayne started. Cocaine, he cried. Yes, my father taught him to take it. Your father, said Chayne slowly, trying to fit this new and astounding fact in with the rest. But why? I think I can tell you, said Sylvia. My father knew quite well that he had me working against him, trying to rescue Walter Hine out of his hands. And I was beginning to get some power. He understood that and destroyed it. I was no match for him. I thought that I knew something of the underside of life. But he knew more, ever so much more, and my knowledge was of no avail. He taught Walter Hine the craving for cocaine, and he satisfied the craving. There was his power. He provided the drug. I do not know. I might perhaps have fought against my father and won. But against a father and a drug I was helpless. 
My father obtained it in sufficient quantity, withheld it at times, gave it at other times, played with him, tantalized him, gratified him. You can understand there was only one possible result. Walter Hine became my father's slave, his dog. I no longer counted in his thoughts at all. I was nothing. Yes, said Chayne. The device was subtle, diabolically subtle. But he wondered whether it was only to counterbalance and destroy Sylvia's influence that Garrett Skinner had introduced cocaine to Hines' notice, whether he had not had in view some other end, even still more sinister. "'I saw very little of Mr. Hine after our return to London,' she continued. "'He did not come often to the house, but when he did come, each time I saw that he had changed. He had grown nervous and violent of temper.' Even before we left Dorsetshire, the violence had become noticeable. Oh, said Chayne, looking quickly at Sylvia, before you left Dorsetshire? Yes, and my father seemed to me to provoke it, though I could not guess why. For instance, yes, said Chayne, tell me. He spoke quietly enough, but once again there was audible a certain intensity in his voice. There had been an occasion when Sylvia had given to him more news of Garrett Skinner than she had herself. Was she to do so once more? He leaned forward with his eyes on hers. The night when you came back to me, do you remember, Hilary? And a smile lightened his face. I shall forget no moment of that night, sweetheart, while I live, he whispered, and blushes swept prettily over her face, and in a sweet confusion she smiled back at him. Oh, Hilary, she said. Oh, Sylvia, he mimicked and as they laughed together it seemed there was a danger that the story of the months of separation would never be completed. But Chayne brought her back to it. Well, on that night when I came back? I saw you in the road from my window, and then motioning you to be silent I disappeared from the window. Yes, I remember, said Chayne eagerly. He began to think that the cocaine was after all going to fit in with the incidents of that night. Walter Hine and my father were going up to bed. I heard them on the stairs. They were going earlier than usual. You are sure? interrupted Chayne. Think well. Much earlier than usual, and they were quarrelling. At least Walter Hine was quarrelling, and my father was speaking to him as if he were a child. That hurt his vanity and made him worse. Your father was provoking him? Sylvia's forehead puckered. I could not say that and be sure of it, but I can say this. If my father had wished to provoke him to a greater anger, it's in that way that he would have done it. Yes, I see. They were speaking loudly, even my father was, more loudly than usual, especially at that time, for when they went upstairs they usually went very quietly. And again Chayne interrupted her. Your father might have wanted you to hear the quarrel, he suggested. Sylvia turned to him curiously. "'Why should he wish that?' she asked, and considered the point. He might have. Only, on the other hand, they were earlier than usual. They would not be so careful to go quietly. I was likely to be still awake.' "'Exactly,' said Chayne. "'For in the probability that Sylvia would be still awake, would hear the violent words of Hine, and would therefore be an available witness afterward, Chayne found the reason both of the loudness of Garrett Skinner's tones and his early retirement for the night. "'Did you hear what was said? Can you repeat the words?' he asked. "'Yes. My father was keeping something from Mr. Hine which he wanted. I have no doubt it was the cocaine.' And she repeated the words. "'Yes,' said Chayne. "'Yes,' in the tone of one who was satisfied. The incident of the lighted room and the shadow on the ceiling were clear to him now a quarrel of which there was a witness, a quarrel all to the credit of Garrett Skinner, since it arose from his determination to hinder Walter Hine from poisoning himself with drugs. At least that is how the evidence would work out. The quarrel continued in Walter Hine's bedroom, whither Garrett Skinner had accompanied his visitor, a struggle begun for the possession of the drug, begun by a man half crazy for want of it, a blow in self-defense delivered by Garrett Skinner, perhaps a fall from the window. That is how Chayne read the story of that night, as fashioned by the ingenuity of Garrett Skinner. But on one point he was still perplexed. The story had not been told out to its end that night. 
there had come an unexpected shout which had interrupted it, and indeed for ever had prevented its completion on that spot. But why had it not been completed afterward, during the next few months, somewhere else? It had not been completed, for here was Sylvia, with all her fears allayed, continuing the story of those months. But violence was not the only change in Walter Hine. There were some physical alterations which frightened me. Mr. Hine, as I say, came very seldom to our house, though my father saw a great deal of him. Otherwise I should have noticed them before. But early this year he came, and you remember he was fair. Well, his skin had grown dark, quite dark. His complexion had changed altogether. And there was something else which shocked me. His tongue was black, really black. I asked him what was the matter. He grew restless and angry and lied to me, and then he broke down and told me he could not sleep. He slept for a few minutes only at a time. He really was ill, very ill. Was this the explanation? Chayne asked himself. Having failed at the quick process, the process of the lighted room and the open window, had Garrett Skinner left the drug to do its work slowly and surely? He was so weak, so broken in appearance, that I was alarmed. My father was not in the house. I sent for a cab, and I took Mr. Hine myself to a doctor. The doctor knew at once what was amiss. For a time Mr. Hine said no, but he gave in at last. He was in the habit of taking thirty grains of cocaine a day. Thirty grains? exclaimed Chain. Yes, of course it could not go on. Death or insanity would surely follow. He was warned of it, and for a while he went into a home. Then he got better, and he determined to go abroad and travel. "'Who suggested that?' asked Jane. "'I do not know. I know only that he refused to go without my father, and that my father consented to accompany him.' Jane was startled. "'They are away together now?' he cried. A look of horror in his eyes betrayed his fear. He stared at Sylvia. Had she no suspicion, she who knew something of the underside of life? But she quietly returned his look. I took precautions. I told my father what I knew, not merely that Mr. Hine had acquired the habit of taking cocaine, but who had taught him the habit. Yes, I did that, she said simply, answering his look of astonishment. It was difficult, my dear, and I would very much have liked to have had you there to help me through with it. But since you were not there, since I was alone, I did it alone. I thought of you, Hilary, while I was saying what I had to say. I tried to hear your voice speaking again outside the Chalet de Lognan. What you know, that you must do. I warned my father that if any harm came to Walter Hine from taking the drug again, any harm at all which I traced to my father, I would not keep silent. Chain leaned back in his seat. You've said that? To Garrett Skinner? Sylvia! And the warmth of pride and admiration in his voice brought the color to her cheeks and compensated her for that bad hour. You stood up alone and braved him out? My dear, if I had only been there, and you never wrote to me a word of it! It would only have troubled you, she answered. It would not have helped me to know that you were troubled. And he, your father, he asked, how did he receive it? Sylvia's face grew pale, and she stared at the tablecloth as though she could not for the moment trust her voice. Then she shuddered and said in a low and shaking voice, so vivid was still the memory of that hour, I thought that I should never see you again. She said no more. From those few words and from the manner in which she uttered them, Chain had to build up the terrible scene which had taken place between Sylvia and her father in the little back room of the house in Hobart Place. He looked round the lighted room, listened to the ripple of light voices, and watched the play of lively faces and bright eyes. There was an incongruity between these surroundings and the words which he had heard which shocked him. "'My dear, I'll make it up to you,' he said. "'Trust me, I will. There shall be good hours now.' I'll watch you till I know surely, without a word from you, what you are thinking and feeling and wanting. Trust me, dearest. With all my heart and the rest of my life, she answered, her smile responding to his words, and she resumed her story. I extracted from my father a promise that every week he should write to me and tell me how Mr. Hine was and where they both were, 
and to that, at last, he consented. They have been away together for two months, and every week I have heard, so I think there is no danger. Chain did not disagree, but on the other hand he did not assent. I suppose Mr. Hine is very rich, he said doubtfully. No, replied Sylvia, that's another reason why I am not afraid. She chose the words rather carefully, unwilling to express a deliberate charge against her father. I used to think that he was, in the beginning, when Captain Barstow won so much from him, but when the bets ceased and no more cards were played, I used to puzzle over why they ceased last year. But I think I have hit upon the explanation. My father discovered then what I only found out a few weeks ago. I wrote to Mr. Hines' grandfather, telling him that his grandson was ill, and asking him whether he would not send for him. I thought that would be the best plan. Yes? Well? Well, the grandfather answered me very shortly that he did not know his grandson, that he did not wish to know him, and that they had nothing to do with one another in any way. It was a churlish letter. He seemed to think that I wanted to marry Mr. Hine, and she laughed as she spoke, and that I was trying to find out what we should have to live upon. I suppose that it was natural that he should think so, and I am so glad that I wrote, for he told me that although Mr. Hine must eventually have a fortune, it would not be until he himself died, and that he was a very healthy man. So, you see, there could be no advantage to any one and she did not finish the sentence. But Chain could finish it for himself. There could be no advantage to anyone if Walter Hine died. But then why the cocaine? Why the incident of the lighted window? Yes, he said in perplexity, I can corroborate that. It happened that my friend John Lattery, who was killed in Switzerland, was also connected with Joseph Hine. He also would have inherited and I knew from him that the old man did not recognize his heirs. But, but Walter Hine had money, some money at all events, and he earned none. From whom did he get it? Sylvia shook her head. I do not know. Had he no other relations, no friends? None who would have made him an allowance? Chayne pondered over the question, for in the answer to it he was convinced that he would find the explanation of the mystery. If money was given to Walter Hine, who had apparently no rich relations but his grandfather, and certainly no rich friends, it would have been given with some object. To discover the giver and his object, that was the problem. Think, did he never speak of any one? Sylvia searched her memories. No, she said, he never spoke of his private affairs. He always led us to understand that he drew an allowance from his grandfather. But your father found that that was untrue when you were in Dorsetshire ten months ago, for the card-playing and the bets ceased. Yes, Sylvia agreed thoughtfully. Then her face brightened. I remember a morning when Mr. Hine was in trouble. Wait a moment. He had a letter. We were at breakfast, and the letter came from Captain Barstow. There was some phrase in the letter which Mr. Hine repeated. As between gentlemen. That was it. I remember thinking at the time what in the world Captain Barstow could know about gentlemen, and wondering why the phrase should trouble Mr. Hine. And that morning Mr. Hine went to London. Oh, did he? cried Chayne. As between gentlemen, had Hine been losing money lately to Captain Barstow? Yes, on the day when you first came. The starlings! exclaimed Chayne in some excitement. That's it. Walter Hine owes money to Captain Barstow, which he can't pay. Barstow writes for it, a debt of honor between gentlemen. One can imagine the letter. Hine goes up to London. Well, what then? Sylvia started. My father went to London two days afterward. Are you sure? It seemed to Chain that they were getting hot in their search. Quite sure, for I remember that after his return his manner changed. What I thought to be the new plot was begun. The cards disappeared, the bet ceased, Mr. Parman, who was brought down with the cocaine. I remember it all clearly, for I always associated the change with my father's journey to London. You came one evening, do you remember? You found me alone and afraid. My father and Walter Hine were walking arm in arm in the garden. That was afterward. Yes, you were afraid because there was no sincerity in that friendship. Now, let me get this right. 
He remained silent for a little while, placing the events in their due order, and interpreting them, one by the other. "'This is what I make of it,' he said at length. "'The man in London who supplies Walter Hine with money finds that Walter Hine is spending too much. He therefore puts himself into communication with Garrett Skinner, of whom he has doubtless heard from Walter Hine. Garrett Skinner travels to London, has an interview, and a concerted plan of action is agreed upon, which Garrett Skinner proceeds to put in action. He spoke so gravely that Sylvia turned anxiously toward him. "'What do you infer, then?' she asked. "'That we are in very deep and troubled waters, my dear,' he replied, but he would not be more explicit. He had no doubt in his mind that the murder of Walter Hine had been deliberately agreed upon by Garrett Skinner and the unknown man in London. But just as Sylvia had spared him during his months of absence, so now he was minded to spare Sylvia. Only, in order that he might spare her, in order that he might prevent shame and distress greater than she had known, he must needs go on with his questioning. He must discover, if by any means he could, the identity of the unknown man who was so concerned in the destiny of Walter Hine. Of your father's friends, was the one who was rich, who came to the house, who were his companions? Very few people came to the house. There was no one amongst them who fits in. And upon that she started. I wonder, she said thoughtfully, and she turned to her lover. After my father had gone away, I found a telegram in a drawer in one of the rooms. There was no envelope, there was just the telegram. So I opened it. It was addressed to my father. I remember the words, for I did not know whether there was not something which needed attention. It ran like this. What are you waiting for? Hurry up! Was it signed? asked Jane. Yes, Jarvis, replied Sylvia. Jarvis, Jane repeated and he spoke it yet again, as though in some vague way it was familiar to him. What was the date of the telegram? It had been sent a month before I found it, so I put it back into the drawer. "'What are you waiting for? Hurry up, Jarvis,' said Chain slowly, and then he remembered how and when he had come across the name of Jarvis before. His face grew very grave. "'We are in deep waters, my dear,' he said." There had been trouble in his regiment some years before, in which the chief figures had been a subaltern and a money-lender. Jarvis was the name of the money-lender, an unusual name. Just such a man would be likely to be Garrett Skinner's confederate and backer. Chain ran over the story in his mind again, by this new light. It certainly strengthened the argument that the Mr. Jarvis who sent the telegram was Mr. Jarvis the money-lender. Thus did Chain work it out in his thoughts. Jarvis, for some reason unknown, pays Walter Hine an allowance. Walter Hine gives it out that he receives it from his grandfather, whose heir he undoubtedly is, and being a vain person much exaggerates the amount. He falls into Garrett Skinner's hands, who with the help of Barstow and others proceeds to pluck him. Walter Hine loses more than he has, and applies to Jarvis for more. Jarvis elicits the facts, and instead of disclosing who Garrett Skinner is, and the obvious swindle of which Hine is the victim, takes Garrett Skinner into his confidence. What happened at the interview between Mr. Jarvis and Garrett Skinner in London, the subsequent facts make plain. At Jarvis's instigation, the plot to swindle Walter Hine becomes a cold-blooded plan to murder him. That plan has been twice frustrated, once by me in Dorsetshire, and a second time by Sylvia. So far the story worked out naturally, logically. But there remained two questions. For what reason did Mr. Jarvis make Walter Hine an allowance? And how would Walter Hine's death profit him? Chayne pondered over these two questions, and then the truth flashed upon him. He remembered how the subaltern had been extracted from his difficulties. Money had been raised by a life insurance. Again Chain ranged his facts in order. Walter Hine is the heir to great wealth, but he has no money now. Mr. Jarvis makes him an allowance, the money to be repaid with a handsome interest on his grandfather's death. But in order to ensure Jarvis from loss, if Walter Hine should die first, Walter Hine's life is insured for a large sum. 
Thus Mr. Jarvis makes his position tenable should his conduct be called in question. Having insured Walter Hine's life, he arranges with Garrett Skinner to murder him. The attempt failed the first time. The slower method is then adopted by Garrett Skinner, and as a result comes the impatient telegram, What are you waiting for? Hurry up! The case was thus so far clear, but anxiety remained. Was the plan abandoned altogether now that Sylvia had stood bravely up and warned her father that she would not keep silent? So certainly Sylvia thought. But then she did not know all that Chayne knew. It seemed that she had not understood the incident of the lighted window. Nor was Chayne surprised, for she was unaware of what was in Chayne's eyes the keystone of the whole argument. She did not know that her father had worked as a convict in the Portland quarries. "'So they are abroad together, your father and Walter Hine,' said Chayne slowly. "'Yes,' replied Sylvia, with a smile. "'Guess where they are now.' and she turned to him with a tender look upon her face, which he did not understand. "'I can't guess.' "'At Chamonix.' She saw her lover flinch, his face grow white, his eyes stare in horror. And she wondered, for her, the little town, overtopped by its tumbled, glittering fields of snow, and tall rock spires, was a place apart. She cherished it in her memories, keeping clear and distinct the windings of its streets, where they narrowed, where they broadened into open spaces, yet all the while her thoughts transformed it, and made of its mere stones and bricks a tiny city, magical with light and grace. For while she stayed in it, her happiness had dawned, and she saw it always roseate with the dawn. It seemed to her that plots and thoughts of harm could there hardly outlive one starlit night, one sunlit day. Had she mapped out her father's itinerary, thither and nowhere else would she have sent him. "'You are afraid?' she asked. "'Hillary, why?' Chayne did not answer her question. He was minded to spare her, even as she had spared him. He talked of other things until the restaurant grew empty, and the waiters began to turn out the lights as a hint to these two determined loiterers. Then, in the darkness, for now there was but one light left, and that at a little distance from their table, Chayne leaned forward, and turning to Sylvia, as they sat side by side, "'You have been happy to-night?' "'Very,' she answered and there was a thrill of joyousness in her clear low voice, as though her heart sang within her. Her eyes rested on his with pride. No man could quite understand, she said. Well, then why should we wait longer, Sylvia, he said. We have waited long enough, my dear. We have, after all, no one but ourselves to please. I should like our marriage to take place as soon as possible. Sylvia answered him without affectation. I, too, she whispered. Tomorrow, then. I'll get a special license tomorrow morning and make the arrangements. We can go away together at once. Sylvia smiled, and the smile deepened into a laugh. Where shall we go, Hilary? she cried. To some perfect place. To Chamonix, he answered. That was where we first met. There could be no better place. We can just go and tell your father what we have done, and then go up into the hills. It was well done. He spoke without wakening Sylvia's suspicions. She had never understood the episode of the lighted window. She did not know that her father was Gabriel Strood, of whose exploits in the Alps she had read. She believed that all danger to Walter Hine was past. Chayne, on the other hand, knew that hardly at any time could Hine have stood in greater peril. To Chamonix he must go, and to Chamonix he must take Sylvia, too for by the time when he could reach Chamonix, he might already be too late. There might be publicity, inquiries, and for Garrett Skinner ruin, and worse than ruin. Would Sylvia let her lover share the dishonor of her name? He knew very surely she would not. Therefore he would have the marriage. By the way, he said, as he draped her cloak about her shoulders, you have that telegram from Jarvis? Yes. That's good, he said. It might be useful. End of chapter 21
Chapter Twenty Two of Running Water by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Revailloux revisited. Never that familiar journey across France seemed to change so slow. Would he be in time? Would he arrive too late? The throb of the wheels beat out the question in a perpetual rhythm and gave him no answer. The words of Jarvis's telegram were ever present in his mind, and grew more sinister the more he thought upon them. What are you waiting for? Hurry up! Once, when the train stopped over long as it seemed to him, he muttered the words aloud, and then glanced in alarm at his wife, lest perchance she had overheard them. But she had not. She was remembering her former journey along this very road. Then it had been night, now it was day. Then she had been used to seek respite from her life in the shelter of her dreams. Now the dreams were of no use, since what was real made them by comparison so pale and thin. The blood ran strong and joyous in her veins to-day, and looking at her, Chain sent up his prayers that they might not arrive in Chamonix too late. To him, as to her, Walter Hine was a mere puppet, a thing without importance so long as he lived but he must live. Dead, he threatened ruin and dishonour, and since from the beginning Sylvia and he had shared, for so she would have it, had shared in the effort to save this life, it would be well for them, he thought, that they should not fail. The long hot day drew to an end, and at last from the platform at the end of the electric train they saw the snow-fields lift toward the soaring peaks, and the peaks purple with the afterglow stand solitary and beautiful against the evening sky. At last, said Sylvia, with a catch in her breath, and the clasp of her hand tightened upon her husband's arm. But Chain was remembering certain words once spoken to him in a garden of Dorsetshire, by a man who lay idly in a hammock and stared up between the leaves. On the most sunny day, the mountains hold in their recesses mystery and death. "'You know where your father is staying?' Chain asked. "'He wrote from the Hôtel de Larve,' Sylvia replied. "'We will stay at Coutet's and walk over to see him this evening,' said Chain, and after dinner they strolled across the little town. But at the Hôtel de Larve they found neither Garrett Skinner nor his friend Walter Hine. "'Only the day before yesterday,' said the proprietor, "'they started for the mountains. Always they make expeditions.' Chain drew no satisfaction from that statement. Garrett Skinner and his friend would make many expeditions from which both men would return in safety. Garrett Skinner was no blunderer, and when at the last he returned alone with some flawless story of an accident in which his friend had lost his life, no one would believe but that here was another mishap and another name to be added to the Alpine death toll. "'To what mountain have they gone?' Chain asked. To no mountain to-day. They crossed the Col du Géant, monsieur, to Courmayeur. But after that I do not know. Oh, into Italy, said Chain in relief. So far there was no danger. The Col du Géant, that great pass between France and Italy, across the range of Mont Blanc, was almost a highway. There would be too many parties abroad amongst its ice serac on these days of summer for any deed which needed solitude and secrecy. When do you expect them back? In five days, monsieur, not before. And at this reply, Chain's fears were all renewed, for clearly the expedition was not to end with the passage of the Col du Géant. There was to be a sequel, perhaps some hazardous ascent, some expedition at all events which Garrett Skinner had not thought fit to name. They took guides, I suppose, he said. One guide, monsieur, and a porter. Monsieur need not fear. For Monsieur Skinner is of an excellence prodigious. My father! exclaimed Sylvia in surprise. I never knew. What guide? asked Chain. Pierre de Louvain. And so once again Chain's fears were allayed. He turned to Sylvia. A good name, sweetheart. I never climbed with him, but I know him by report. A prudent man, as prudent as he is skilful. He would run no risks. The name gave him indeed greater comfort than even his words expressed. Doulouvain's mere presence would prevent the commission of any crime. His great strength would not be needed to hinder it, for he would be there to bear witness afterward. 
Chayne was freed from the dread which during the last two days had oppressed him. Perhaps, after all, Sylvia was right, and the plot was definitely abandoned. Chayne knew very well that Garrett Skinner's passion for the Alps was a deep and real one. Perhaps it was that alone which had brought him back to Chamonix. Perhaps one day in the train, travelling northward from Italy, he had looked from the window and had seen the slopes of Monte Rosa white in the sun, white with a look of white velvet, and all the last twenty years had fallen from him like a cloak, and he had been drawn back as with chains to the high playground of his youth. Chayne could very well understand that possibility, and eased of his fears he walked away with Sylvia back to the open square in the middle of town. Darkness had come, and both stopped with one accord, and looked upward to the massive barrier of hills. The rock peak stood sharply up against the clear dark sky, the snow slopes glimmered faintly like a pale mist, and incredibly far, incredibly high, underneath a bright and dancing star, shone a dim and rounded whiteness, the snow cap of Mont Blanc. A year ago, said Sylvia, drawing a breath, and bethinking her of the black shadows which during those twelve months had lain across her path. Yes, a year ago we were here, said Chayne. The little square was thronged, the hotels and houses were bright with lights, and from here and from there music floated out upon the air, the light and lilting melodies of the day. Sylvia, you see the café down the street, there by the bridge? Yes. A year ago, on just such a night as this, I sat with my guide, Michel Revailloux. I was going to cross the Col d'Olan on the morrow. He had made his last ascent. We were not very cheerful, and he gave me, as a parting present, the one scrap of philosophy his life had taught him. He said, Take care that when the time comes for you to get old, that you have someone to share your memories. Take care that when you go home in the end, there shall be someone waiting in the room, and the lamp lit against your coming. Sylvia pressed against her side the hand which he had slipped through her arm. But he did more than give advice, Chayne continued, for as he went away to his home in the little village of Les Pras Conduits, just across the fields, he passed Coutet's hotel and saw you under the lamp talking to a guide he knew. You were making your arrangements to ascend the Charmoz, but he dissuaded you. Yes. He convinced you that your first mountain should be the Aiguille d'Argentière. He gave you no doubt many reasons but not the real one which he had in his thoughts. Sylvia looked at Chayne in surprise. He sent you to the Aiguille d'Argentière because he knew that so you and I would meet at the Pavillon de l'Oignon. But he had never spoken to me until that night, exclaimed Sylvia. Yet he had noticed you. When I went up to fetch down my friend Lattery, you were standing on the hotel step. You said to me, I am sorry. Michel heard you speak, and that evening talked of you. He had the thought that you and I were matched. Sylvia looked back to the night before her first ascent. She pictured to herself the old guide, coming down the narrow street and out of the darkness, into the light of the lamp above the doorway. She recalled how he had stopped at the sight of her, how cunningly he had spoken. He had desired that her last step on to her first summit should bring to her eyes and soul a revelation which no length of after years could dim. That was the argument, and it was just the argument which would prevail with her. So it was his doing, she cried with a laugh, and at once grew serious, dwelling as lovers will, upon the small accident which had brought them together, and might so easily never have occurred. An unknown guide speaks to her in a doorway, and lo, for her the world is changed, dark years come to an end, the pathway broadens to a road, she walks not alone. Whatever the future may hold, she walks not alone. Suppose there had been no lamp above the doorway, suppose there had been a lamp and she not there, suppose the guide had passed five minutes sooner or five minutes later. Oh, Hilary, she cried, and put the thought from her. I was thinking, he said, that if you were not tired we might walk across the fields to Michel's house. He would, I think, be very happy if we did. A few minutes later they knocked upon Michel's door. Michel Revailloux opened it himself, 
and stood for a moment peering at the dim figures in the darkness of the road. "'It is I, Michel,' said Chayne, and at the sound of his voice Michel Revailloux drew him with a cry of welcome into the house. "'So you have come back to Chamonix, monsieur. That is good.' And he looked his monsieur over from head to foot, and shook him warmly by the hand. "'Ah, you have come back!' "'And not alone, Michel,' said Chayne. Revailloux turned to the door, and saw Sylvia standing there. She was on the threshold, and the light reached to her. Sylvia moved into the low-roofed room. It was a big, long room, bare and with a raftered ceiling, and since one oil-lamp lighted it, it was full of shadows. The chain it had a lonely and dreary look. He thought of his own house in Sussex, and of the evening he had passed there, thinking it just as lonely. He felt perhaps at this moment, more than at any, the value of the great prize which he had won. He took her hand in his, and turning to Michel, said simply, "'We are married, Michel. We reached Chamonix only this evening. You were the first of our friends to know of our marriage.' Michel's face lighted up. He looked from one to the other of his visitors, and nodded his head once or twice. Then he blew his nose vigorously. "'But I let you stand!' he cried, in a voice that shook a little, and he bustled about pushing chairs forward, and of a sudden stopped. He came forward to Sylvia, very gravely, and held out his hand. She put her hand into his great palm. "'Madame, I will not pretend to you that I am not greatly moved. This is a great happiness to me,' he said with simplicity. He made no effort to hide either the tears which filled his eyes, or the unsteadiness of his voice. "'I am very glad for the sake of Monsieur Chayne, but I know him well. We have been good friends for many a year, madame.' "'I know, Michel,' she said. "'And I can say, therefore, with confidence, I am very glad for your sake, too. I am also very glad for mine. A minute ago I was sitting here alone. Now you are both here and together. Madame, it was a kind thought which brought you both here to me at once.' "'To whom else should we come?' said Sylvia, with a smile. "'Since it was you, Michel, who would not let me ascend the Aiguille des Charmots when I wanted to.' Michel was taken aback for a moment, then his wrinkled and weather-beaten face grew yet more wrinkled, and he broke into a low and very pleasant laugh. "'Since my diplomacy has been so successful, madame, I will not deny it. From the first moment when I heard you, with your small and pretty voice, say, on the steps of the hotel, I am sorry, to my patron in his great distress, and when I saw your face, too thoughtful for one so young, I thought it would be a fine thing if you and he could come together. In youth, to be lonely, what is it? You slip on your hat and your cloak, and you go out. But when you are old, and your habits are settled, and you do not want to go out at nights to search for company, then it is as well to have a companion, and it is well to choose your companion in your youth, madame, so that you may have many recollections to talk over together when the good of life is chiefly recollection. He made his visitors sit down, fetched out a bottle of wine, and offered them the hospitalities of his house, easily and naturally, like the true gentleman he was. It seemed to Chain that he looked a little older, that he was a little more heavy in his gait, a little more troubled with his eyes than he had been last year. But at all events to-night he had the spirit, the good humour of his youth. He talked of old exploits upon peaks then unclimbed. He brought out his guide's book, in which his messieurs had written down their names, and the dates of the climbs, and the photographs which they had sent to him. "'There are many photographs of men grown famous, madame,' he said proudly, with whom I had the good fortune to climb when they and I and the Alps were all young together. But it is not only the famous who are interesting. Look, madame, here is your husband's friend, Monsieur Lattery a good climber, but not always very sure on ice. "'You always will say that, Michel,' protested Chayne. "'I never knew a man so obstinate.' Michel Revailloux smiled, and said to Sylvia, "'I knew he would spring out on me. Never say a word against Monsieur Lattery if you would keep friends with Monsieur Chayne. See, I give you good advice in return for your kindness in visiting an old man.' 
Nevertheless, and he dropped his voice in a pretense of secrecy, and nodded emphatically, it is true, Monsieur Lattery was not always sure on ice. And here, madame, is the portrait of one whose name is no doubt known to you in London, Professor Kenyon. Sylvia, who was turning over the leaves of the guide's little book, looked up at the photograph. It was taken many years ago, she said. Twenty or twenty-five years ago, said Michel, with a shrug of the shoulders, when he and I and the Alps were young. Chain began quickly to look through the photographs outspread upon the table. If Kenyon's portrait was amongst Revailloux's small treasures, there might be another which he had no wish for his wife to see, the portrait of the man who climbed with Kenyon, who was Kenyon's John Lattery. There might well be the group before the Monte Rosa Hotel in Zermatt, which he himself had seen in Kenyon's rooms. Fortunately, however, or so it seemed to him, Sylvia was engrossed in Michel's little book. End of chapter 22「Running Water」by A. E. W. Mason。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Michel Revailloux's Fürbuch The book, indeed, was of far more interest to her than the portrait of any mountaineer. It had a romance, a glamour of its own. It was just a little notebook with blue-lined pages and an old, dark-red, soiled leather cover, which could fit into the breast pocket and never be noticed there but it went back to the early days of mountaineering, when even the passes were not all discovered, and many of them were still uncrossed, when mythical peaks were still gravely allotted their positions and approximate heights in the maps, and when the easy expedition of the young lady of today was the difficult achievement of the explorer. It was to the early part of the book to which she turned. Here she found first a sense, of which she had read with her heart in her mouth, a sense since made famous, simply recorded in the handwriting of the men who had accomplished them, the dates, the hours of starting and returning, a word or two perhaps about the condition of the snow, a warm tribute to Michel Revailloux and the signatures. The same names recurred year after year, and often the same hand recorded year after year attempts on one particular pinnacle, until at the last, perhaps after fifteen or sixteen failures, weather and snow and the determination of the climbers conspired together and the top was reached those were the grand days cried sylvia michel you must be proud of this book i value it very much madame he said smiling at her enthusiasm michel was a human person and to have a young girl with a lovely face looking at him out of her great eyes in admiration, and speaking almost in a voice of awe, was flattery of a soothing kind. Yes, many have offered to buy it from me at a great price, Americans and others, but I would not part with it. It is me, and when I am inclined to grumble, as old people will, and to complain that my bones ache too sorely, I have only to turn over the pages of that book to understand that I have no excuse to grumble, for I have the proof there that my life has been very good to live. No, I would not part with that little book. Sylvia turned over the pages slowly, naming now this mountain, now that, and putting a question from time to time as to some point in the climb which she remembered to have read, and concerning which the narrative had not been clear. And then a cry of surprise burst from her lips. Chain had just assured himself that there was no portrait of Gabriel Strood amongst those spread out on the table. "'What is it, madame?' asked Michel. Sylvia did not answer, but stared in bewilderment at the open page. Chain saw the book which she was reading, and knew that his care lest she should come across her father's portrait was of no avail. He crossed around behind her chair and looked over her shoulder. There, on the page in her father's handwriting, was the signature, Gabriel Strood. Sylvia raised her face to Hilary's, and before she could put her question, he answered it quietly, with a nod of the head. Yes, that is so, he said. You knew? I have known it for a long time, he replied. Sylvia was lost in wonder. Yet there was no doubt in her mind. 
Gabriel Strood, of whom she had made a hero, whose exploits she knew almost by heart, had suffered from a physical disability which might well have kept the most eager mountaineer to the level. It was because of his mastery over his disability that she had set him so high in her esteem. Well, there had been a day when her father had tramped across the downs to Dorchester, and had come back lame, and in spite of his lameness, had left his companions behind. Other trifles recurred to her memory. She had found him reading The Alps in 1864, and, yes, he had tried to hide from her the title of the book. On their first meeting he had understood at once when she had spoken to him of the emotion which her first mountain peak had waked in her. And before that, yes, her guide had cried aloud to her, You remind me of Gabriel Strood. She owed it to him that she had turned to the Alps as to her heritage, and that she had brought to them an instinctive knowledge. Her first feeling was one of sheer pride in her father. Then the doubts began to thicken. He called himself Garrett Skinner. "'Why, but why?' she cried impulsively, and Chain, still leaning on her chair, pressed her arm with his hand and warned her to be silent. "'I will tell you afterward,' he said quietly, and then he suddenly drew himself upright. The movement was abrupt, like the movement of a man thoroughly startled, more startled even than she had been by the unexpected sight of her father's handwriting. She looked up into his face. He was staring at the open page of Michel's book. She turned back to it herself and saw nothing which should so trouble him. Over Gabriel Strood's signature there were just these words written in his hand, and nothing more. Mont Blanc by the Brenva route, July, 1868. Yet it was just that sentence which had so startled Hilary. Gabriel Strood had then climbed Mont Blanc from the Italian side up from the glacier to the top of the great rock buttress, then along the world-famous ice arête, thin as a knife-edge, and to the right and left precipitous as a wall, and on the far side above the ice ridge, up the hanging glaciers, and the ice cliffs to the summit of the corridor, from the Italian side of the range of Mont Blanc. And the day before yesterday, Gabriel Strood had crossed with Walter Hine to Italy, bound upon some expedition which would take five days, five days at the least. It was to the Brenva ascent of Mont Blanc that Garrett Skinner was leading Walter Hine. The thought flashed upon Chain, swift as an inspiration, and as convincing. Chain was sure, the Brenva route. It was to this climb Garrett Skinner's thoughts had perpetually recurred during that one summer afternoon in the garden in Dorsetshire, when he had forgotten his secrecy, and spoken even with his enemy of the one passion they had in common. Chayne worked out the dates, and they fitted in with his belief. Two days ago Garrett Skinner started to cross the Col de Géant. He would sleep very likely in the hut on the Col, and go down the next morning to Courmayeur, and make his arrangements for the Brenva climb. On the third day, to-day, he would set out with Walter Hine, and sleep at the gîte on the rocks in the bay to the right of the great ice-fall of the Brenva Glacier. Tomorrow he would ascend the buttress, traverse the ice ridge with Walter Hine, perhaps, yes, only perhaps, and at that thought Chain's heart stood still. And even if he did, there were hanging ice-cliffs above, and yet another day would pass before any alarm at his absence would be felt. Surely it would be the Brenva route. Garrett Skinner himself would run great risk upon this hazardous expedition. That was true. But Chain knew enough of the man to be assured that he would not hesitate on that account. The very audacity of the exploit marked it out as Gabriel Strood's. Moreover, there would be no other party on the Bredver Ridge to spy upon his actions. There was just one fact, so far as Chain could judge, to discredit his inspiration the inconvenient presence of a guide. Do you know a guide de Louvain, Michel? Indeed, yes, it's a good name, monsieur, and borne by a man worthy of it. So I thought, said Chayne, Pierre de Louvain, and Michel laughed scornfully and waved the name away. Pierre, no, indeed, he cried. Monsieur, never engage Pierre de Louvain for your guide. I speak solemnly. Joseph, yes, and whenever you can secure him. I thought you spoke of him. 
But, Pierre, he is a cousin who lives upon Joseph's name, a worthless fellow, a drunkard. Monsieur, never trust yourself or any one whom you hold dear with Pierre de Louvain. Chayne's last doubt was dispelled. Garrett Skinner had laid his plans for the Brenva route. Somewhere on that long and difficult climb the accident was to take place. The very choice of a guide was in itself a confirmation of Chayne's fears. It was a piece of subtlety altogether in keeping with Garrett Skinner. He had taken a bad and untrustworthy guide on one of the most difficult expeditions in the range of Mont Blanc. Why, he would be asked, and the answer was ready. He had confused Pierre de Louvain with Joseph, his cousin, as no doubt many another man had done before. Did not Pierre live on that very confusion? The answer was not capable of refutation. Chayne was in despair. Garrett Skinner had started two days before from Chamonix, was already now at this moment asleep, with his unconscious victim at his side, high up on the rocks of the upper Brenva glacier. There was no way to hinder him, no way unless God helped. He asked abruptly of Michel, "'Have you climbed this season, Michel?' Michel laughed grimly. "'Indeed, yes, to the Montanvert, monsieur, and beyond, yes, beyond, to the Jardin.' Chayne broke in upon his bitter humour. "'I want the best guide in Chamonix. I want him at once. I must start by daylight.' Michel glanced up in surprise, but what he saw in Chayne's face stopped all remonstrance. "'For what ascent, monsieur?' he asked. "'The Brenva route.' "'Madame will not go.' No, I go alone. I must go quickly. There is very much at stake. I beg you to help me. In answer, Michel took his hat down from a peg, and while he did so, Chayne turned quickly to his wife. She had risen from her chair, but she had not interrupted him. She had asked no questions. She had uttered no prayer. She stood now, waiting upon him with a quiet and beautiful confidence, which deeply stirred his heart. Thank you, sweetheart, he said quietly. You can trust. I thank you. Yet he added gravely, Whatever happens, you and I, there is no altering that. Michel opened the door. I will walk with you into Chamonix, and I will bring the best guides I can find to your hotel. They passed out and crossed the fields quickly to Chamonix. Do you go to your hotel, monsieur, said Revailloux, and leave the choice to me. I must go about it quietly. If you were to come with me, we should have to choose the first two guides upon the rota, and that would not do for the Brenva climb. He left them at the door of the hotel, and went off upon his errand. Sylvia turned at once to Hilary. Her face was very pale, her voice shook. You will tell me everything now. Something terrible has happened. No doubt you feared it. You came to Chamonix because you feared it, and now you know that it has happened. Yes, said Chayne. I hid it from you, even as you spared me your bad news all this last year. Tell me now, please, if it is to be you and I, as you said just now, you will tell me. Chayne led the way into the garden, and drawing a couple of chairs apart from the other visitors, told her all that he knew, and she did not. He explained the episode of the lighted window, solved for her the riddle of her father's friendship for Walter Hine, and showed her the reason for this expedition to the summit of Mont Blanc. She uttered one low cry of horror. Murder, she whispered. To think that we are two days behind, that even now they are sleeping on the rocks, he and Walter Hine, sleeping quite peacefully and quietly. Oh, it's horrible, he cried, beating his hands upon his forehead in despair. And then he broke off. He saw that Sylvia was sitting with her hands covering her face, while every now and then a shudder shook her and set her trembling. "'I am so sorry, Sylvia,' he cried. "'Oh, my dear, I had so hoped we should be in time. I would have spared you this knowledge if I could. Who knows, we may still be in time.' And as he spoke, Michel entered the garden with one other man and came toward him. "'Henri Simon,' said Michel, presenting his companion. "'You will know that name. Simon has just come down from the Crépon, monsieur. He will start with you at daylight. Chayne looked at Simon. He was of no more than the middle height, but broad of shoulder, deep of chest, and long of arm. 
His strength was well known in Chamonix, as well known as his audacity. "'I am very glad that you can come, Simon,' said Chayne. "'You are the very man.' And then he turned to Michel. "'But we should have another guide. I need two men.' "'Yes,' said Michel. Three men are needed for that climb.' And Chayne left him to believe that it was merely for the climb that he needed another guide. "'But there is André de Rose already at Courmayeur,' he continued. "'His patron was to leave him there to-day. A telegram can be sent to him to-morrow, bidding him wait. If he has started, we shall meet him to-morrow on the Col du Géant. And de Rose, monsieur, is the man for you. He is quick, as quick as you and Simon. The three of you together will go well. As for to-morrow, you will need no one else.' But if you do, monsieur, I will go with you. There is no need, Michel, replied Chayne gratefully, and thereupon Sylvia plucked him by the sleeve. I must go with you to-morrow, Hilary, she pleaded wistfully. Oh, you won't leave me here. Let me come with you as far as possible. Let me cross to Italy. I will go quick. If I get tired, you shall not know. It will be a long day, Sylvia. It cannot be so long as the day I should pass waiting here. She wrung her hands as she spoke. The light from a lamp fixed in the hotel wall fell upon her upturned face. It was white, her lips trembled, and in her eyes Chayne saw again the look of terror, which he had hoped was gone for ever. Oh, please, she whispered. Yes, he replied, and he turned again to Simon. At two o'clock, then, my wife will go, so bring a mule. We can leave it at the Montanvert. The guides tramped from the garden. Chayne led his wife toward the hotel, slipping his arm through hers. You must get some sleep, Sylvia. Oh, Hilary, she cried, I shall bring shame on you. We should never have married, and her voice broke in a sob. Hush, she replied. Never say that, my dear. Never think it. Sleep. You will want your strength to-morrow. But Sylvia slept little, and before the time she was ready with her ice-axe in her hand. At two o'clock they came out from the hotel in the twilight of the morning. There were two men there. "'Ah, you have come to see us off, Michel,' said Chayne. "'No, monsieur, I bring my mule,' said Revailloux with a smile, and he helped Sylvia to mount it. "'To lead mules to the Montanvert. Is that not my business?' Simon has a rope, he added, as he saw Chain sling a coil across his shoulder. We may need an extra one, said Chain, and the party moved off upon its long march. At the Montanvert Hotel, on the edge of the Mer de Glace, Sylvia descended from her mule, and at once the party went down onto the ice. Au revoir, shouted Michel from above, and he stood and watched them until they passed out of his sight. Sylvia turned and waved her hand to him, but he made no answering sign, for his eyes were no longer good. "'He is very kind,' said Sylvia. "'He understood that there was some trouble, and while he led the mule he sought to comfort me. And then, between a laugh and a sob, she added, "'You will never guess how. He offered to give me his little book with all the signatures, the little book which means so much to him.' It was the one thing which he had to offer her as Sylvia understood, and always thereafter she remembered him with a particular tenderness. He had been a good friend to her, asking nothing and giving what he had. She saw him often in the times which were to come, but when she thought of him, she pictured him as on that early morning, standing on the bluff of cliff by the Montanvert, with the reins of his mule thrown across his arm, and straining his old eyes to hold his friends in view. Later that day, amongst the Serac of the Col du Géant, Simon uttered a shout, and a party of guides returning to Chamonix changed their course toward him. Droz was amongst the number, and consenting at once to the expedition which was proposed to him, he tied himself onto the rope. "'Do you know the Brenva ascent?' Chain asked of him. "'Yes, monsieur. I have crossed Mont Blanc once that way. I shall be very glad to go again.' We shall be the first to cross for two years, if only the weather holds. Do you doubt that? asked Chayne anxiously. The morning had broken clear, the day was sunny and cloudless. I think there may be wind to-morrow, he replied, raising his face 
and judging by signs unappreciable to other than the trained eyes of a guide. "'But we will try, eh, monsieur?' he cried, recovering his spirits. "'We will try. We will be the first on the Brenva Ridge for two years.' But there Chayne knew him to be wrong. There was another party somewhere on the great ridge at this moment. Had it happened, he asked himself, how was it to happen? What kind of an accident was it to be, which could take place with a guide, however worthless, and which would leave no suspicion resting on Garrett Skinner? There would be no cutting of the rope, of that he felt sure. That method might do very well for a melodrama, but actually, no. Garrett Skinner would have a better plan than that. And indeed he had a better plan and a simpler one, a plan which not merely would give to any uttered suspicion the complexion of malignancy, but must even bring Mr. Garrett Skinner honour and great praise. But no idea of the plan occurred either to Sylvia or to Chayne, as all through that long, hot day they toiled up the icefall of the Col du Géant and over the passes. It was evening before they came to the pastures, night before they reached Courmayeur. There Chayne found full confirmation of his fears. In spite of effort to dissuade them, Garrett Skinner, Walter Hine, and Pierre de Louvain had started yesterday for the Brenva climb. They had taken porters with them as far as the sleeping place upon the glacier rocks. The porters had returned. Chayne sent for them. Yes, they said. At half-past two this morning the climbing party descended from the rocks onto the icefall of the glacier. They should be at the hut at the Grand Mulet now, on the other side of the mountain, if not already in Chamonix. Perhaps monsieur would wish for porters to-morrow? No, said Chayne, we mean to try the passage in one day. And he turned to his guides. I wish to start at midnight. It is important. We shall reach the glacier by five. Will you be ready? and at midnight, accordingly, he set out by the light of a lantern. Sylvia stood outside the hotel, and watched the flame diminish to a star, dance for a little while, and then go out. For her, as for all women, the bad hour had struck when there was nothing to do but to sit and watch and wait. Perhaps her husband, after all, was wrong, she said to herself, and repeated the phrase, hoping that repetition would carry conviction to her heart. But early on that morning Chayne had sure evidence that he was right, for as he, Simon, and André Droz were marching in single file through the thin forest behind the chalet of La Brenva, a shepherd lad came running down toward them. He was so excited that he could hardly tell the story with which he was hurrying to Courmayeur. Only an hour before he had seen, high up on the Brenva ridge, a man waving a signal of distress. Both Simon and Droz discredited the story. The distance was too great. The sharpest eyes could not have seen so far. But Chayne believed, and his heart sank within him. The puppet and Garrett Skinner. What did they matter? But he turned his eyes down toward Courmayeur. It was Sylvia upon whom the blow would fall. The story cannot be true, cried Simon. But Chayne bethought him of another day long ago, when a lad had burst into the hotel in Zermatt, and told, with no more acceptance for his story, of an avalanche which he had seen fall from the very summit of the Matterhorn. Chayne looked at his watch. It was just four o'clock. There has been an accident, he said. We must hurry. End of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four of Running Water》by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Brenva Ridge. The peasant was right. He had seen a man waving a signal of distress on the slopes of Mont Blanc above the great buttress, and this is how the signal came to be waved. An hour before Chayne and Sylvia set out from Chamonix to cross the Col du Géant and while it was yet quite dark, a spark glowed suddenly on an island of rocks set in the great white waste of the Brenva glacier. The spark was a fire lit by Pierre de Louvain, for Garrett Skinner's party had camped upon those rocks. The morning was cold, and one by one the porters, Garrett Skinner and Walter Hine, gathered about the blaze. Overhead the stars glittered in a clear dark sky. It was very still. 
No sound was heard at all but the movement in the camp, even on the glacier a thousand feet below, where all night long the avalanches had thundered, in the frost of the early morning there was silence. Garrett Skinner looked upward. "'We shall have a good day,' he said, and then he looked quickly toward Walter Hine. "'How did you sleep, Wally?' "'Very little. The avalanches kept me awake. Besides, I slipped and fell a hundred times at the corner of the path,' he said with a shiver. "'A hundred times I felt emptiness beneath my feet.' He referred to a mishap of the day before. On the way to the gîte, after the chalet and the wood are left behind, a little path leads along the rocks of the Mont de la Brenva, high above the glacier. There are one or two awkward corners to pass, where rough footsteps have been hewn in the rock. At one of these corners Walter Hine had slipped. His side struck the step. He would have dropped to the glacier, but Garrett Skinner had suddenly reached out a hand and saved him. Garrett Skinner's face changed. "'You were not afraid,' he said. "'You think we can do it?' asked Hine nervously, and Garrett Skinner laughed. "'Ask Pierre Delouvain,' he said, and himself put the question. Pierre laughed in his turn. "'Bah! I snap my fingers at the Brenva climb,' said he. "'We shall be in Chamonix to-night,' and Garrett Skinner translated the words to Walter Hine. Breakfast was prepared and eaten. Walter Hine was silent through the meal. He had not the courage to say that he was afraid, and Garrett Skinner played upon his vanity. "'We shall be in Chamonix to-night. It will be a fine feather in your cap, Wally. One of the historic climbs.' Walter Hine drew a deep breath. If only the day were over, and the party safe on the rough path through the woods on the other side of the mountain. But he held his tongue. Moreover, he had great faith in his idol and master, Garrett Skinner. "'You saved my life yesterday,' he said, and upon Garrett Skinner's face there came a curious smile. He looked steadily into the blaze of the fire, and spoke almost as though he made an apology to himself. "'I saw a man falling. I saw that I could save him. I did not think. My hand had already caught him.' He looked up with a start. In the east the day was breaking, pale and desolate. The lower glacier glimmered into view beneath them, the gigantic amphitheatre of hills which girt them in on three sides loomed out of the mists from aerial heights and took solidity and shape. Westward the black and rugged Puteret ridge, eastward the cliffs of Mont Maudit, and northward sweeping around the head of the glacier the great ice wall of Mont Blanc with its ruined terraces and inaccessible cliffs. Time, Wally, said Garrett Skinner, and he rose to his feet and called to Pierre Delouvain. There are only three of us. We shall have to go quickly. We do not want to carry more food than we shall need. The rest we can send back with our blankets by the porters. Pierre Delouvain justified at once the ill words which had been spoken of him by Michel Revailloux. He thought only of the burden which through this long day he would have to carry on his back. Yes, that is right, he said. We will take what we need for the day. Tonight we shall be in Chamonix. And thus the party set off with no provision against the most probable of all mishaps, the chance that sunset might find him still upon the mountainside. Pierre de Louvain, being lazy and a worthless fellow, as Revailloux had said, agreed, but the suggestion had been made by Garrett Skinner, and Garrett Skinner was Gabriel Strood, who knew, none better, the folly of such light travelling. The rope was put on, Pierre de Louvain led the way, Walter Hine, as the weakest of the party, was placed in the middle. Garrett Skinner came last. The three men mounted by a snow slope and a gully to the top of the rocks which supported the upper Brenva glacier. "'That's our road, Wally,' said Garrett Skinner. He pointed to a great buttress of rock overlain here and there with fields of snow, which jutted out from the ice wall of the mountain, descended steeply, bent to the west in a curve, and then pushed far out into the glacier, as some great promontory pushes out into the sea. Do you see a hump above the buttress on the crest of the ridge, and a little to the right, and to the right of the hump a depression in the ridge? That they call the corridor. Once we are there, our troubles are over. But between the party and the buttress stretched the great ice-fall of the upper Brenva glacier. Crevassed, broken, a wilderness of towering sirach, 
It had the look of a sea in a gale whose breakers had been frozen in the very act of overtoppling. Come, said Pierre. Keep the rope stretched tight, Wally, said Garrett Skinner, and they descended into the furrows of that wild and frozen sea. The day's work had begun in earnest, and almost at once they began to lose time. Now it was a perilous strip of ice between unfathomable blue depths along which they must pass, as bridge-builders along their girders, yet without the bridge-builders' knowledge that at the end of the passage there was a further way. Now it was some crevasse into which they must descend, cutting their steps down a steep rib of ice. Now it was a wall up which the leader must be hoisted on the shoulders of his companions, and even so, as likely as not, his fingers could not reach the top, but handholds and footholds must be hewn with the axe till a ladder was formed. Now it was some crevasse gaping across their path. They must search this way and that for a firm snow-bridge by which to overpass it. It was difficult, as Pierre Toulouvain discovered, to find a path through that tangled labyrinth without some knowledge of the glacier. For only at rare times, when he stood high on a serac, could he see his way for more than a few yards ahead. Pierre aimed straight for the foot of the buttress, working thus due north, and he was wrong. Garrett Skinner knew it, but said not a word. He stood upon insecure ledges, and supported de Louvain upon his shoulders, and pushed him up with his ice-axe into positions which only involved the party in further difficulties. He took his life in his hands, and risked it, knowing the better way. Yet all the while the light broadened, the great violet shadows crept down the slopes, and huddled at the bases of the peaks. Then the peaks took fire, and suddenly along the dull white slopes of ice in front of them the fingers of the morning flashed in gold. Over the eastern rocks the sun had leaped into the sky. For a little while longer they advanced deeper into the entanglement, and when they were about halfway across they came to a stop. They were on a tongue of ice which narrowed to a point. The point abutted against a perpendicular ice wall thirty feet high. Nowhere was there any break in that wall, and at each side of the tongue the ice gaped in chasms. We must go back, said Pierre. I have forgotten the way. He had never known it. Seduced by a treble fee, he had assumed an experience which he did not possess. Garrett Skinner looked at his watch, and turning about led the party back for a little while. Then he turned to his right and said, I think it might go in this direction. And lo, making steadily across some difficult ground, no longer in a straight line northward to Mont Blanc, but westward toward the cliffs of the Peteret Ridge, under Garrett Skinner's lead, they saw a broad causeway of ice open before them. The causeway led them to steep slopes of snow, up which it was just possible to kick steps, and then working back again to the east they reached the foot of the great buttress on its western side, just where it forms a right angle with the face of the mountain. Garrett Skinner once more looked at his watch. It had been half-past two when they had put on the rope. It was now close upon half-past six. They had taken four hours to traverse the ice-fall, and they should have taken only two and a half. Garrett Skinner, however, expressed no anxiety. On the contrary, one might have thought that he wished to lose time. "'There is one of the difficulties disposed of,' he said cheerily. "'You did very well, Wally, very well. It was not altogether nice, was it? But you won't have to go back.' Walter Hine had indeed crossed the glacier without complaint. There had been times when he had shivered, times when his heart within him had swelled with a longing to cry out, Let us go back! But he had not dared. He had been steadied across the narrow bridge with the rope, hauled up the ice walls, and let down again on the other side. But he had come through. He took some pride in the exploit, as he gazed back from the top of the snow slope across the tumult of ice to the rocks on which he had slipped. He had come through safely, and he was encouraged to go on. "'We won't stop here, I think,' said Garrett Skinner. They had already halted upon the glacier for a second breakfast. The sun was getting hot upon the slopes above, and small showers of snow and crusts of ice were beginning to shoot down the gullies of the buttress at the base of which they stood. We will have a third breakfast when we are out of range. He called to Dulouvin, who was examining the face of the rock buttress, up which they must ascend to its crest, and said, 
It looks as if we should do well to work out to the right, I think. The rocks were difficult, but their difficulty was not fully appreciated by Walter Hine. Nor did he understand the danger. There were gullies in which new snow lay in a thin crust over hard ice. He noticed that in those gullies the steps were cut deeper into the ice below, that Garrett Skinner bade him not loiter, and that Pierre Delouvain in front made himself fast and drew in the rope with a particular care when it came to his turn to move. But he did not know that all that surface snow might peel off in a moment and swish down the cliffs, sweeping the party from their feet. There were rounded rocks and slabs with no hold for hand or foot but roughness, roughness in the surface, and here and there a wrinkle. But the guide went first, as often as not pushed up by Garrett Skinner, and Walter Hine, like many another inefficient man before him, came up like a bundle on the rope afterward. Thus they climbed for three hours more. Walter Hine, nursed by gradually lengthening expeditions, was not as yet tired. Moreover, the exhilaration of the air and excitement helped to keep fatigue aloof. They rested just below the crest of the ridge and took another meal. "'Eat often and little. That's the golden rule,' said Garrett Skinner. "'No brandy, Wally. Keep that in your flask.' Pierre de Louvain, however, followed a practice not unknown amongst Chamonix guides. "'Absinthe is good on the mountains,' said he. When they rose, the order of going was changed. Pierre de Louvain, who had led all the morning, now went last, and Garrett Skinner led. He led quickly and with great judgment or knowledge. Pierre de Louvain, at the end of the rope, wondered whether it was judgment or knowledge, and suddenly Walter Hine found himself standing on the crest with Garrett Skinner, and looking down the other side upon a glacier far below, which flows from the Mur de la Côte on the summit ridge of Mont Blanc into the Brenva Glacier. "'That's famous!' cried Garrett Skinner, looking once more at his watch. He did not say that they had lost yet another hour upon the face of the buttress. It was now half-past nine in the morning. "'We are twelve thousand feet up, Wally,' and he swung to his left and led the party up the ridge of the buttress. As they went along this ridge, Wally Hine's courage rose. It was narrow but not steep, nor was it ice. It was either rock or snow in which steps could be kicked. He stepped out with a greater confidence. If this were all, the Brenda climb was a fraud, he exclaimed to himself, in the vanity of his heart. Ahead of them a tall black tower stood up, hiding what lay beyond, and up toward this tower Garrett Skinner led quickly. He no longer spoke to his companions. He went forward, assured, an inspiring assurance. He reached the tower, passed it, and began to cut steps. His axe rang as it fell. It was ice into which he was cutting. This was the first warning which Walter Hine received, but he paid no heed to it. He was intent upon setting his feet in the steps. He found the rope awkward to handle and keep tight. His attention was absorbed in observing his proper distance. Moreover, in front of him the stalwart figure of Garrett Skinner blocked his vision. He went forward. The snow on which he walked became hard ice, and instead of sloping upward, ran ahead almost in a horizontal line. Suddenly, however, it narrowed. Hine became conscious of appalling depths on either side of him. It narrowed with extraordinary rapidity. Half a dozen paces behind him he had been walking on a broad, smooth path, now he walked on the width of the top of a garden wall. His knees began to shake. He halted. He reached out vainly into emptiness for some support on which his shaking hands might clutch. And then, in front of him, he saw Garrett Skinner sit down and bestride the wall. Over Garrett Skinner's head he now saw the path by which he needs must go. He was on the famous ice ridge and nothing so formidable, so terrifying, had even entered into his dreams during his sleep upon the rocks where he had bivouacked. It thinned to a mere sharp edge, a line without breadth of cold blue ice, and it stretched away through the air for a great distance until it melted suddenly into the face of the mountain. On the left hand an almost vertical slope of ice dropped to depths which Hine did not dare to fathom with his eyes. On the right there was no such slope at all. A wall of crumbling snow descended from the edge, straight as a weighted line. 
On neither side could the point of the axe be driven in to preserve the balance. Walter Hine uttered a whimpering cry. I shall fall, I shall fall. Garrett Skinner, astride of the ridge, looked over his shoulder. Sit down, he cried sharply. But Walter Hine dared not. He stood, all his courage gone, tottering on the narrow top of the wall, afraid to stoop lest his knees should fail him altogether and his feet slip from beneath him, to bend down until his hands could rest upon the ice and meanwhile to keep his feet. No, he could not do it. He stood trembling, his face distorted with fear, and his body swaying a little from side to side. Garrett Skinner called sharply to Pierre Delouvain. Quick, Pierre! There was no time for Garrett Skinner to return, but he gathered himself together on the ridge, ready for a spring. Had Walter Hine toppled over and swung down the length of the rope, as at any moment he might have done, Garrett Skinner was prepared. He would have jumped down the opposite side of the ice arête, though how either he or Walter Hine could have regained the ridge he could not tell. Would any one of the party live to return to Courmayeur and tell the tale? But Garrett Skinner knew the risk he took, had counted it up long before ever he brought Walter Hine to Chamonix, and thought it worth while. He did not falter now. All through the morning, indeed, he had been taking risks, risks of which Walter Hine did not dream, with so firm and yet so delicate a step he had moved from crack to crack, from ice step up to ice step, with so obedient a response of his muscles he had drawn himself up over the rounded rocks from ledge to ledge. He shouted again to Pierre Delouvain, and at the same moment began carefully to work backward along the ice arête. Pierre, however, hurried. Walter Hine heard the guide's voice behind him, felt himself steadied by his hands. He stooped slowly down, knelt upon the wall, and then bestrode it. "'Now forward!' cried Skinner, and he pulled in the rope. "'Forward! We cannot go back!' Hine clung to the ridge. Behind him Pierre de Louvain sat down and held him about the waist. Slowly they worked themselves forward, while Garrett Skinner gathered in the rope in front. The wall narrowed as they advanced, became the merest edge which cut their hands as they clasped it. Hine closed his eyes, his head whirled, he was giddy, he felt sick. He stopped gripping the slope on both sides with his knees, clutching the sharp edge with the palms of his hands. "'I can't go on, I can't!' he cried, and he reeled like a novice on the back of a horse. Garrett Skinner worked back to him. "'Put your arms about my waist, Wally. Keep your eyes shut. You shan't fall!' Walter Hine clung to him convulsively. Pierre Delouvain steadied Hine from behind, and thus they went slowly forward for a long while. Garrett Skinner gripped the edge with the palms of his hands, so narrow was the ridge, the fingers of one hand pointed down one slope, the fingers of the other down the opposite wall. Their legs dangled. At last Walter Hine felt Garrett Skinner loosening his clasped fingers from about his waist. Garrett Skinner stood up, uncoiled the rope, chipped a step or two in the ice, and went boldly forward. For a yard or two further, Walter Hine straddled on, and then Garrett Skinner cried to him, "'Look up, Wally, it's all over!' Hine looked and saw Garrett Skinner standing upon a level space of snow on the side of the mountain. A moment later he himself was lying in the sun upon the level space. The famous ice arête was behind them. Walter Hine looked back along it and shuddered. The thin edge of ice, curving slightly downward, stretched away to the black rock tower, in the bright sunlight a thing most beautiful, but most menacing and terrible. He seemed cut off by it from the world. They had a meal upon that level space, and while Hine rested, Pierre de Louvain cast off the rope and went ahead. He came back in a little while with a serious face. "'Will it go?' asked Garrett Skinner. It must, said de Louvain, for we can never go back. And suddenly alarmed lest the way should be barred in front as well as behind him, Walter Hine turned and looked above him. His nerves were already shaken. At the sight of what lay ahead of him, he uttered a cry of despair. It's no use, he cried. We can never get up. And he flung himself upon the snow and buried his face in his arms. Garrett Skinner stood over him. We must, he said. Come, look. 
Walter Hine looked up and saw his companion dangling the face of his watch before his eyes. "'We are late. It is now twelve o'clock. We should have left this spot two hours ago and more,' he said very gravely. And Pierre Dulouvin exclaimed excitedly, "'Certainly, monsieur, we must go on. It will not do to loiter now.' And stooping down, he dragged rather than helped Walter Hine to his feet. The quiet gravity of Garrett Skinner and the excitement of de Louvain frightened Walter Hine equally. Some sense of his own insufficiency broke in at last upon him. His vanity peeled off from him, just at the moment when it would most have been of use. He had a glimpse of what he was, a poor, weak, inefficient thing. Above them the slope stretched upward to a great line of towering ice-cliffs. Through and up those ice-cliffs a way had to be found, and at any moment, loosened by the sun, Huge blocks and pinnacles might break from them and come thundering down. As it was, upon their right hand, where the snow-fields fell steeply in a huge ice-gully, between a line of rocks and the cliffs of Mont Maudit, the avalanches plunged and reverberated down to the Brenva glacier. Pierre de Louvain took the lead again, and keeping by the line of rocks, the party ascended the steep snow-slopes straight toward the wall of cliffs. But in a while the snow thinned, and the axe was brought into play again. Through the thin crust of snow, steps had to be cut into the ice beneath, and since there were still many hundreds of feet to be ascended, the steps were cut wide apart. With the sun burning upon his face, and his feet freezing in the ice steps, Walter Hine stood and moved, and stood again all through that afternoon. Fatigue gained upon him, and fear did not let him go. If I only get off this mountain, he said to himself, with heartfelt longing, never again. When near to the cliffs, Pierre de Louvain stopped. In front of him the wall was plainly inaccessible. Far away to the left there was a depression, up which possibly a way might be forced. I think, monsieur, that must be the way, said Pierre. But you should know, said Garrett Skinner. It is some time since I was here. I have forgotten and Pierre began to traverse the ice-slope to the left. Garrett Skinner followed without a word, but he knew that when he had ascended Mont Blanc by the Brenva route twenty-three years before, he had kept to the right along the rocks to a point where that ice-wall was crevassed, and through that crevasse had found his path. They passed quickly beneath an overhanging rib of ice which jutted out from the wall, and reached the angle then formed at four o'clock in the afternoon. "'Our last difficulty, Wally,' said Garrett Skinner, as he cut a large step in which Hine might stand. "'Once up that wall, our troubles are over.' Walter Hine looked at the wall. It was not smooth ice, it was true. Blocks had broken loose from it, and left it bulging out here, there, and in places fissured. But it stood at an angle of sixty-five degrees. It seemed impossible that any one should ascend it. He looked down the slope up which they had climbed. It seemed equally impossible that any one should return. Moreover, the sun was already in the west, and the ice promontory under which they stood shut its warmth from them. Walter Hine was in the shadow, and he shivered with cold as much as with fear. For half an hour Pierre de Louvain tried desperately to work his way up that ice wall, and failed. "'It is too late,' he said. "'We shall not get up to-night.' Garrett Skinner nodded his head. No, nor get down, he added gravely. I am sorry, Wally. We must go back and find a place where we can pass the night. Walter Hine was in despair. He was tired. He was desperately cold. His gloves were frozen, his fingers and his feet numbed. Oh, let's stop here, he cried. We can't, said Garrett Skinner, and he turned as he spoke and led the way down quickly. There was need for hurry. Every now and then he stopped to cut an intervening step, where those already cut were too far apart, and at times to give Hine a hand, while de Louvain let him down with the help of the rope from behind. Slowly they descended, and while they descended the sun disappeared, the mists gathered about the precipices below, the thunder of the avalanches was heard at rare intervals, the ice cliffs above them glimmered faintly and still more faintly. The dusk came. They descended in a ghostly twilight. At times the mists would part, and below them, infinite miles away, 
they saw the ice fields of the Brenva glacier. The light was failing altogether when Garrett Skinner turned to his left and began to traverse the slopes to a small patch of rocks. Here, he said, as he reached them, we must sit here until morning comes. End of chapter 24《Chapter Twenty Five of Running Water》by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Night on an Ice Slope. At the base of the rocks, there was a narrow ledge on which, huddled together, the three men could sit side by side. Garrett Skinner began to clear the snow from the ledge with his ice axe, but Walter Hine sank down at once, and Pierre de Louvain who might have shown a better spirit, promptly followed his example. "'What is the use?' he whispered. "'We shall all die to-night. I have a wife and family. Let us eat what there is to eat and then die.' And drowsily repeating his words, he fell asleep. Garrett Skinner, however, roused him, and drowsily he helped to clear the ledge. Then Walter Hine was placed in the middle, that he might get what warmth and shelter there was to be had. The rope was hitched over a spike of rock behind, so that if any one fell asleep he might not fall off, and de Louvain and Skinner took their places. By this time darkness had come. They sat upon the narrow ledge, with their backs to the rock, and the steep snow-slopes falling away at their feet. Far down a light or two glimmered in the chalets of La Brenva. Garrett Skinner emptied the rick on his knees. Let us see what food we have, he said. We made a mistake in not bringing more. But Pierre was so certain that we should reach Chamonix to-night. We shall die to-night, said Pierre. Nonsense, said Garrett Skinner. We are not the first party which has been caught by the night. Their stock of food was certainly low. It consisted of a little bread, a tin of sardines, a small pot of jam, some cold bacon, a bag of acid drops, a couple of cakes of chocolate, and a few biscuits. We must keep some for the morning, he said. Don't fall asleep, Wally. You had better take off your boots and muffle your feet in the rick It will keep them warmer and save you from frostbite. You might as well squeeze the water out of your stockings, too. Garrett Skinner waked Hine from his drowsiness, and insisted that his advice should be followed. It would be advisable that it should be known afterward in Courmayeur, that he had taken every precaution to preserve his companion's life. He took off his own stockings and squeezed the water out, replaced them, and laced on his boots. For to him, too, the night would bring some risk. Then the three men ate their supper. A very little wine was left in the gourd which Garrett Skinner had carried on his back, and he filled it up with snow and thrust it inside his shirt, that it might melt the sooner. "'You have your brandy flask, Wally, but be sparing of it. Brandy will warm you for the moment, but it leaves you more sensitive to the cold than you were before. That's a known fact. And don't drink too much of the snow water. It may make you burn inside. At least, so I have been told, he added. Hine drank and passed the bottle to Pierre, who took it with his reiterated moan. What's the use? We shall all die to-night. Why should a poor guide with a wife and family be tempted to ascend mountains? I will tell you something, monsieur he cried suddenly across Walter Hine. I am not fond of the mountains. No, I am not fond of them. And he leaned back and fell asleep. Better not follow his example, Wally. Keep awake. Slap your limbs. Above the three men the stars came out very clear and bright. The tiny lights in the chalets far below disappeared one by one. The cold became intense. At times Garrett Skinner roused his companions, and holding each other by the arm, they rose simultaneously to their feet and stamped upon the ledge. But every movement hurt them, and after a while Walter Hine would not. "'Leave me alone,' he said, "'to move tortures me.' Garrett Skinner had his pipe and some tobacco. He lit, shading the match with his coat, and then he looked at his watch. "'What time is it? Is it near morning?' asked Hine, in a voice which was very feeble. A little longer to wait, said Garrett Skinner cheerfully. The hands marked a quarter to ten. And afterward they grew very silent, except for the noise which they made in shivering. 
Their teeth chattered with the chill. They shook in fits which lasted for minutes. Walter Hind moaned feebly. All about them the world was bound in frost. The cold stars glittered overhead. The mountains took their toll of pain that night. Yet there was one among those three perched high on a narrow ledge of rock amongst the desolate heights, who did not regret. Just for a night like this Garrett Skinner had hoped. Walter Hine, weak of frame and with little stamina, was exposed to the rigors of a long alpine night, thirteen thousand feet above the level of the sea, with hardly any food and no hope of rescue for yet another day and yet another night. There could be but one end to it. Not until tomorrow would any alarm at their disappearance be awakened, either at Chamonix or at Courmayeur. It would need a second night before help reached them. So Garrett Skinner had planned it out. There could be but one end to it. Walter Hine would die. There was a risk that he himself might suffer the same fate. He was not blind to it. He had taken the risk knowingly, and with a certain indifference. It was the best plan, since, if he escaped alive, suspicion could not fall on him. Thus he argued, as he smoked his pipe with his back to the rock, and waited for the morning. At one o'clock Walter Hine began to ramble. He took Garrett Skinner and Pierre Doulevin for Captain Barstow and Archie Parminter, and complained that it was ridiculous to sit up playing poker on so cold a night. And while in his delirium he rambled and moaned, the morning began to break. But with the morning came a wind from the north, whirling the snow like smoke about the mountain tops and bitingly cold. Garrett Skinner with great difficulty stood up, slowly and with pain, stretched himself to his full height, slapped his thighs, stamped with his feet, and then looked for a long while at his victim without remorse and without satisfaction. He stooped and sought to lift him. But Hine was too stiff and numbed with the cold to be able to move. In a little while Pierre de Louvain, who had fallen asleep, woke up. The day was upon them now, cold and lowering. "'We must wait for the sun,' said Garrett Skinner. "'Until that has risen and thawed us, it will not be safe to move.' Pierre de Louvain looked about him, worked the stiffened muscles of his limbs, and groaned. "'There will be little sun to-day,' he said. "'We shall all die here.' Garrett Skinner sat down again and waited. The sun rose over the rocks of Montmaudy, but weak and yellow as a guinea. Garrett Skinner then tied his coat to his ice-axe, and standing out upon a rock, waved it this way and that. "'No one will see it,' whimpered Pierre, and indeed Garrett Skinner would never have waved that signal had he not thought the same. "'Perhaps one never knows,' he said. "'We must take all precautions, for the day looks bad.' The sunlight, indeed, only stayed upon the mountainside long enough to tantalize them with vain hopes of warmth. Gray clouds swept up low over the crest of Mont Blanc and blotted it out. The wind moaned wildly along the slopes. The day frowned upon them, sullen and cold, with a sky full of snow. "'We will wait a little longer,' said Garrett Skinner. "'Then we must move.' He looked at the sky. It seemed to him now very probable that he would lose the desperate game which he had been playing. He had staked his life upon it. Let the snow come and the mists, he would surely lose his stake. Nevertheless, he set himself to the task of rousing Walter Hine. "'Leave me alone,' moaned Walter Hine, and he struck feebly at his companions as they lifted him onto his feet. "'Stamp your feet, Wally,' said Garrett Skinner. "'You will feel better in a few moments.' They held him up, but he repeated his cry, "'Leave me alone!' And the moment they let him go, he sank down again upon the ledge. He was overcome with drowsiness. The slightest movement tortured him. Garrett Skinner looked up at the leaden sky. "'We must wait till help comes,' he said. De Louvain shook his head. "'It will not come to-day. We shall all die here.' It was wrong, monsieur, to try the Brenva Ridge. Yes, we shall die here. And he fell to blubbering like a child. Could you go down alone? Garrett Skinner asked. There is the glacier to cross, monsieur. I know, that is the risk. But it is cold and there is no sun. The snow bridges may hold. Pierre de Louvain hesitated. Here, it seemed to him, was certain death. 
But if he climbed down the ice arête, the snow slopes, and the rocks below, if the snow bridges held upon the glacier, there would be life for one of the three. Pierre de Louvain had little in common with that loyal race of Alpine guides, who hold it as their most sacred tradition not to return home without their patron. Yes, it is our one hope, he said, and untying himself with awkward fumbling fingers from the kinked rope, and coiling the spare rope about his shoulders, he went down the slope. During the night the steps had frozen, and in many places it was necessary to recut them. He, too, was stiff with the long vigil. He moved slowly, with numbed and frozen limbs. But as his axe rose and fell, the blood began to burn in the tips of his fingers, to flow within his veins. He went more and more firmly. For a long way Garrett Skinner held him in sight. Then he turned back to Walter Hine upon the ledge, and sat beside him. Garrett Skinner's strength had stood him in good stead. He filled his pipe and lit it and watched beside his victim. The day wore on slowly. At times Garrett Skinner rubbed Hines' limbs, and stamped about the ledge to keep some warmth within himself. Walter Hine grew weaker and weaker. At times he was delirious, at times he came to his senses. "'You leave me,' he whispered once. "'You have been a good friend to me. You can do no more. Just leave me here and save yourself.' Garrett Skinner made no answer. He just looked at Hine curiously. That was all. That was all. It was a curious thing to him that Hine should display an unexpected manliness, almost a heroism. It could not be pleasant even to contemplate being left alone upon these windy and sunless heights to die, but actually to wish it. "'How did you come by so much fortitude?' he asked. And to his astonishment Walter Hine replied, I learnt it from you, old man. From me? Yes. Garrett Skinner gave him some of the brandy, and listened to a portrait of himself, described in broken words, which he was at some pains to recognize. Walter Hine had been seeking to model himself upon an imaginary Garrett Skinner, and thus, strangely enough, had arrived at an actual heroism. Thus would Garrett Skinner have bidden his friends leave him, only in tones less tremulous, and very likely with a laugh, turning back, as it were, to snap his fingers as he stepped out of the world. Thus, therefore, Walter Hine sought to bear himself. Curious, said Garrett Skinner with interest, but with no stronger feeling at all. Are you in pain, Wally? Dreadful pain. We must wait. Perhaps help will come. The day wore on, but what the time was Garrett Skinner could not tell. His watch and Hines had both stopped with the cold, and the dull clouded sky gave him no clue. The last of the food was eaten, the last drop of the brandy drunk. It was bitterly cold. If only the snow would hold off till morning. Garrett Skinner had only to wait. The night would come, and during the night Walter Hine would die. And even while the thought was in his mind, he heard voices. To his amazement, to his alarm, he heard voices. Then he laughed. He was growing light-headed. Exhaustion, cold, and hunger were telling their tale upon him. He was not so young as he had been twenty years before. But to make sure, he rose to his knees and peered down the slope. He had been mistaken. The steep snow-slope stretched downward, wild and empty. Here and there black rocks jutted from them. A long way down four black stones were spaced. There was no living thing in that solitude. He sank back, relieved. No living thing except himself, and perhaps his companion. He looked at Hine closely, shook him, and Hine groaned. Yes, he still lived. For a little time he still would live. Garrett Skinner gathered in his numbed palm the last pipeful of tobacco in his pouch, and spilling the half of it, his hands so shook with cold, his fingers were so clumsy, he pressed it into his pipe and lit it. Perhaps before it was all smoked out, he thought. And then his hallucination returned to him. Again he heard voices, very faint and distant, in a lull of the wind. It was weakness, of course, but he started up again, this time to his feet, and as he stood up his head and shoulders showed clear against the white snow behind him. 
He heard a shout, yes, an undoubted shout. He stared down the slope, and then he saw. The four black stones had moved, were nearer to him. They were four men ascending. Garrett Skinner turned swiftly toward Walter Hine, reached for his ice-axe, grasped it, and raised it. Walter Hine looked at him with staring, stupid eyes, but raised no hand, made no movement. He, too, was conscious of an hallucination. It seemed to him that his friend stood over him with a convulsed and murderous face, in which rage strove with bitter disappointment, but that he held his axe by the end, with the adze head swung back above his head to give greater force to the blow, and that while he poised it there came a cry from the confines of the world, and that upon that cry his friend dropped the axe, and stooping down to him murmured, "'There's help quite close, Wally.' Certainly those words were spoken. That, at all events, was no hallucination. Walter Hine understood it clearly. For Garrett Skinner suddenly stripped off his coat, passed it round Hine's shoulders, and then, bearing his own chest, clasped Hine to it, that he might impart to him some warmth from his own body. Thus they were found by the rescue party, and the story of Garrett Skinner's great self-sacrifice was long remembered in Courmayeur. Garrett Skinner watched the men mounting, and wondered who they were. He recognized his own guide, Pierre de Louvain. But who were the others? How did they come there on a morning so forbidding? Who was the tall man who walked last but one? And as the party drew nearer, he saw and understood. But he did not change from his attitude. He waited until they were close. Then he and Hilary Chain exchanged a look. You, said Garrett Skinner. Yes, Chayne paused. Yes, Mr. Strood, he said. And in those words all was said. Garrett Skinner knew that his plan was not merely foiled, but also understood. He stood up and looked about him, and even to Chayne's eyes there was a dignity in his quiet manner, his patience under defeat. For Garrett Skinner, rogue though he was, the mountains had their message. All through that long night, while he sat by the side of his victim, they had been whispering it. Whether bound in frost beneath the stars, or sparkling to the sun, or grey under a sky of clouds, or buried deep in flakes of whirling snow, they spoke to him always of the grandeur of their indifference. They might be traversed and scaled, but they were unconquered always, because they were indifferent. The climber might lie in wait through the bad weather at the base of the peak, seize upon his chance and stand upon the summit with a cry of triumph and derision. The mountains were indifferent. As they endured success, so they inflicted defeat, with a sublime indifference, lifting their foreheads to the stars, as though wrapped in some high communion. Something of their patience had entered into Garrett Skinner. He did not deny his name. He asked no question. He accepted failure and he looked anxiously to the sky. It will snow, I think. They made some tea, mixed it with wine, and gave it first of all to Walter Hine. Then they all breakfasted, and set off on their homeward journey, letting Hine down with the rope from step to step. Gradually Hine regained a little strength. His numbed limbs began to come painfully to life. He began to move slowly of his own accord, supported by his rescuers. They reached the ice ridge. It had no terrors now for Walter Hine. "'He had better be tied close between Pierre and myself,' said Garrett Skinner. "'We came up that way.' "'Between Simon and Rose,' said Chayne quietly. "'As you will,' said Garrett Skinner, with a shrug of the shoulders. Along the ice ridge the party moved slowly and safely, carrying Hine between them. As they passed behind the great rock tower at the lower end, the threatened snow began to fall in light flakes. Quickly, said Chain, we must reach the chalets tonight. They raced along the snow slopes on the crest of the buttress, and turned to the right down the gullies and the ledges on the face of the rock. In desperate haste they descended, lowering Walter Hine from man to man. They crawled down the slabs, dropped from shelf to shelf, wound themselves down the gullies of ice. Somehow without injury the snow slopes at the foot of the rocks were reached. The snow still held off. Only now and then a few flakes fell. But over the mountain the wind was rising, 
It swept down in fierce, swift eddies, and drew back with a roar, like the sea upon shingle. "'We must get off the glacier before night comes,' cried Chain, and led by Simon, the rescue party went down into the ice-fall. They stopped at the first glacier pool, and made Hein wash his hands and feet in the water, to save himself from frostbite, and thereafter for a little time they rested. They went on again, but they were tired men, and before the rocks were reached upon which two nights before Garrett Skinner had bivouacked, darkness had come. Then Simon justified the praise of Michel Revailloux. With the help of a folding lantern which Chain had carried in his pocket, he led the way through that bewildering labyrinth with unerring judgment. Great serracs loomed up through the darkness, magnified in size and distorted in shape. Simon went over and round them and under them, steadily, and the rescue party followed. Now he disappeared over the edge of a cliff into space, and in a few seconds his voice rang upward cheerily. Follow, it is safe. And his ice-axe rang with no less cheeriness. He led them boldly to the brink of abysses which were merely channels in the ice, and amid towering pinnacles which, seen close at hand, were mere blocks shoulder-high. And at last the guide at the tail of the rope heard from far away ahead Simon's voice raised in a triumphant shout, The rocks! The rocks! With one accord they flung themselves, tired and panting, on the sheltered level of the bivouac. Some sticks were found, a fire was lighted, tea was once more made. Walter Hine began to take heart, and as the flames blazed up, the six men gathered about it, crouching, kneeling, sitting, and the rocks resounded with their laughter. "'Only a little further, Wally,' said Garrett Skinner, still true to his part. They descended from the rocks, crossed a level field of ice, and struck the rock path along the slope of the Mont de la Brenva. "'Keep on the rope,' said Garrett Skinner. Hine slipped at a corner as we came up, and Chain glanced quickly at him. There were one or two awkward corners above the lower glacier, where rough footsteps had been hewn. On one of these Walter Hine had slipped, and Garrett Skinner had saved him, had undoubtedly saved him. At the very beginning of the climb, the object for which it was undertaken was almost fulfilled, and would have been fulfilled, but that instinct overpowered Garrett Skinner, and since the accident was unexpected, before he had had time to think, he had reached out his hand and saved the life which he intended to destroy. Along that path Hine was carefully brought to the chalets of La Brenva. The peasants made him as comfortable as they could. He will recover, said Simon. Oh, yes, he will recover. Two of us will stay with him. No need for that, replied Garrett Skinner. Thank you very much, but that is my duty, since Hine is my friend. I think not, said Chain, standing quietly in front of Garrett Skinner. Walter Hine will be safe enough in Simon's hands. I want you to return with me to Courmayeur. My wife is there, and anxious. Your wife? Yes, Sylvia. Garrett Skinner nodded his head. I see, he said slowly. Yes. He looked round the hut. Simon was going to watch by Hine's side. He was defeated utterly, and recognized it. Then he looked at Chain and smiled grimly. On the whole, I am not sorry that you have married my daughter, he said. I will come down to Courmayeur. It will be pleasant to sleep in a bed and together they walked down to Courmayeur, which they reached soon after midnight. End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 of Running Water » by A. E. W. Mason • This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Running Water in two days' time Walter Hine was sufficiently recovered to be carried down to Courmayeur. He had been very near to death upon the Brenva Ridge, certainly the second night upon which Garrett Skinner had counted would have ended his life. He was frost-bitten, and for a long while the shock and the exposure left him weak. But he gained strength with each day, and Chain had opportunities to admire the audacity and the subtle skill with which Garrett Skinner had sought his end. 
for Walter Hine was loud in his praises of his friend's self-sacrifice. Skinner had denied himself his own share of food, had bared his breast to the wind that he might give the warmth of his own body to keep his friend alive. These instances lost nothing in the telling. And they were true. Chain could not deny to Garrett Skinner a certain criminal grandeur. He had placed Hine in no peril which he had not shared himself. He had taken him, a man fitted in neither experience nor health, on an expedition where inexperience or weakness on the part of one was likely to prove fatal to all. There was, moreover, one incident not contemplated by Garrett Skinner in his plan, which made his position absolutely secure. He had actually saved Walter Hine's life on the rocky path of the Mont de la Brenva. There was no doubt of it. He had reached out his hand and saved him. Chayne made much of this incident to his wife. I was wrong, you see, Sylvia, he argued, for your father could have let him fall, and did not. I have been unjust to him, and to you, for you have been troubled. But Sylvia shook her head. You were not wrong, she answered. It is only because you are very kind that you want me to believe it. But I see the truth quite clearly, and she smiled at him. If you wanted me to believe you, you should never have told me of the law a year ago in the Chalet de Lognan. My father obeyed the law, that was all. You know it as well as I. He had no time to think. He acted upon the instinct of the moment. He could not do otherwise. Had there been time to think, would he have reached out his hand? We both know that he would not. But he obeyed the law. What he knew, that he did, obeying the law upon the moment. He could save, and knowing it, he did save, even against his will. Chayne did not argue the point. Sylvia saw the truth too clearly. "'Walter Hine is getting well,' he said. "'Your father is still at another hotel in Courmayeur. There's the future to be considered.' "'Yes,' she said, and she waited. "'I have asked your father to come over tonight after dinner,' said Chayne. And into their private sitting-room Garrett Skinner entered at eight o'clock that evening. It was the first time that Sylvia had seen him since she had learned the whole truth, and she found the occasion one of trial. But Garrett Skinner carried it off. There was nothing of the penitent in his manner. But on the other hand, he no longer affected the manner of a pained and loving parent. He greeted her from the door and congratulated her quietly and simply upon her marriage. Then he turned to Chayne. "'You wish to speak to me? I am at your service.' "'Yes,' replied Chayne. "'We, and I speak for Sylvia, we wish to suggest to you that your acquaintanceship with Walter Hine should end altogether, that it should already have ended.' "'Really?' said Garrett Skinner, with an air of surprise. "'Captain Chayne, the laws of England, revolutionary as they have no doubt become to old-fashioned people like myself, have not yet placed fathers under the guardianship of their sons-in-law, I cannot accept your suggestion. We insist upon its acceptance, said Chayne quietly. Garrett Skinner smiled. Insist, perhaps, but how enforce it, my friend? That's another matter. I think we have the means to do that, said Chayne. We can point out to Walter Hine, for instance, that your ascent from the Brenva Glacier was an attempt to murder him. An ugly word, Captain Chayne. You would find it difficult of proof. The story is fairly complete, returned Chayne. There is, first of all, a telegram from Mr. Jarvis, couched in curious language. Garrett Skinner's face lost its smile of amusement. Indeed, he said. He was plainly disconcerted. Yes. Chayne produced the telegram from his letter-case, read it aloud with his eyes upon Garrett Skinner, and replaced it. What are you waiting for? Hurry up! Jarvis. There is no need at all events to ask Mr. Jarvis what he was waiting for, is there? He wanted to lay his hands upon the money for which Hine's life was insured. Garrett Skinner leaned back in his chair. His eyes never left Chayne's face. His face grew set and stern. He had a dangerous look, the look of a desperate man at bay. Then there was a certain incident to be considered which took place in the house near Weymouth. You must at times have been puzzled by it, 
perhaps a little alarmed, too. Do you remember one evening when a whistle from the shadows on the road and a yokel shout drove you out of Walter Hine's room, sent you creeping out of it as stealthily as you entered? Nay, did more than that, for that whistle and that shout drove you out of Dorsetshire. Ah, I see you remember. Garrett Skinner, indeed, had often enough been troubled by the recollection of that night. The shout, the whistle ringing out so suddenly and abruptly from the darkness and the silence, had struck upon his imagination and alarmed him by their mystery. Who was the man who had seen, and what had he seen? Garrett Skinner had never felt quite safe since that evening. There was some one, a stranger, going about the world with a key to his secret, even if he had not guessed the secret. It was I who whistled, I who shouted. You! cried Garrett Skinner. You! Yes, Sylvia was with me. You thought to do that night what you thought to do a few days ago above the Brenva Ridge. Both times together we were able to hinder you. But once Sylvia hindered you alone. There is the affair of the cocaine. Chayne looked toward his wife with a look of great pride for the bravery which she had shown. She was sitting aloof in the embrasure of the window, with her face averted and a hand pressed over her eyes and forehead. Chayne looked back to Garrett Skinner, and there was more anger in his face than he had ever shown. "'I will never forgive you the distress you have caused to Sylvia,' he said. But Garrett Skinner's eyes were upon Sylvia, and in his face, too, there was a humorous look of pride. She had courage. He remembered how she had confronted him when Walter Hine lay sick. He said no word to her, however, and again he turned to Chayne, who went on. There is also your past career to add weight to the argument, Mr. Strood. Point by point, Chayne set out in detail the case for the prosecution. Garrett Skinner listened without interruption, but he knew that he was beaten. The evidence against him was too strong. It might not be enough legally to secure his conviction at a public trial, though even upon that question there would be the gravest doubt, but it would be enough to carry certitude to every ear which listened and to every eye which read. The game is played out, Chayne continued. We have Walter Hine, and we shall not let him slip back into your hands. How much of the story we shall tell him we are not yet sure, but all, if it be necessary and, if it be necessary, to others beside. There was a definite threat in the last words, but Garrett Skinner had already made up his mind. Since the game was played out, since defeat had come, he took it without anger or excuse. Very well, he said. Peace in the family circle is after all very desirable, eh, Sylvia? I agree with the deepest regret to part from my young friend, Walter Hine. I leave him in your hands. He was speaking with a humorous magnanimity, but his eyes wandered back to Sylvia, who sat some distance away in the embrasure of the window, with her face in her hands, and his voice changed. Sylvia, he said gently, come here. Sylvia rose and walked over to the table. The waiting, the knowledge which had come to her during the last few days, had told their tale. She had the look which Chayne too well remembered, the dark shadows beneath her eyes, the languor in her walk, the pallor in her cheeks, the distress and shame in her expression. "'Sit down,' he said, and she obeyed him reluctantly, seating herself over against him. She gazed at the tablecloth with that mutinous look upon her face, which took away from her her womanhood, and gave to her the aspect of a pretty but resentful child. Garrett Skinner, for the life of him, could not but smile at her. "'Well, Sylvia, you have beaten me. You fought your fight well, and I bear you no malice,' he said lightly. "'But,' and his voice became serious again, "'you sit in judgment on me.' Sylvia raised her eyes quickly. "'No,' she cried. "'I think so,' he persisted. "'I don't blame you. Only I should like you to bear this in mind, that you have in your own life a reason to go gently in your judgments of other people. Chayne stepped forward as though he would interfere, but Sylvia laid her hand upon his arm and checked him. "'I don't think you understand, Hilary,' she said quickly. 
She turned to her father and looked straight at him with an eager interest. "'I wonder whether we are both thinking of the same thing,' she said curiously. "'Perhaps,' replied her father. "'All your life you have dreamed of running water.' And Sylvia nodded her head. "'Yes, yes,' she said, with a peculiar intentness. "'The dream is part of you, part of your life. For all you know, it may have modified your character.' Yes, said Sylvia. It is a part of you, of which you could not rid yourself if you tried. When you are asleep, the stream comes to you. It is as much a part of you as a limb. And again Sylvia answered, Yes. Well, you are not responsible for it. And Sylvia leaned forward. Ah, she said. She had been wondering whether it was to this point that he was coming. You know now why you hear it, why it's part of you. You were born to the sound of running water in that old house in Dorsetshire. Before you were born, in the daytime and in the stillness of the night, your mother heard it week after week. Perhaps even when she was asleep the sound rippled through her dreams. Thus you came by it. It was born in you. Yes, she answered, following his argument step by step very carefully, but without a sign of the perplexity which was evident in Hilary Chain. Chayne stood a little aloof, looking from Sylvia's face to the face of her father, in doubt whither the talk was leading. Sylvia, on the other hand, recognized each sentence which her father spoke as the embodiment of a thought with which she herself was familiar. "'Well, then, here's a definite thing, an influence most likely, a characteristic most certainly, and not of your making. One out of how many influences, characteristics, which are part of you, but not of your making. But we can lay our finger on it. Well, it is a pleasant and a pretty quality, this dream of yours, Sylvia. Yes, a very pleasant one to be born with. But suppose that instead of that dream you had been born with a vice, an instinct of crime, of sin, would you have been any the more responsible for it? If you were not responsible for the good thing, are you responsible for the bad? An awkward question, Sylvia awkward enough to teach you to go warily in your judgments. Yes, said Sylvia, I was amongst the fortunate, I don't deny it. But that's not all, and as Chain moved restively, Garrett Skinner waved an indulgent hand. I don't expect you, Captain Chain, to take an interest in these problems. For a military man, discipline and the penal code are the obvious unalterable solutions. But it is possible that I may never see my daughter again, and— I am speaking to her. And he went back to the old vexed question. It's not only that you were born with these qualities, definite characteristics, definite cravings, for which you are no more responsible than the man in the moon, and which are part of you. But there's something else. How much of your character, how much of all your life to come is decided for you during the first ten or fifteen years of your life? Decided for you, mind, not by you. Upon my soul, I think the whole of it. You don't agree? Well, it's an open question. I believe that at the age of fifteen the lines along which you will move are already drawn, your character formed, your conduct for the future a settled thing. To that Sylvia gave no assent, but she did not disagree. She only looked at her father with a questioning and a troubled face. If it were so, she asked, why had she hated from the first the circle in which her mother and herself had moved? And the answer, or at all events an answer, came as she put the question to herself. She had lived amongst her dreams. She was in doubt. "'Well, hear something of my boyhood, Sylvia,' cried her father, and for the first time his voice became embittered. "'I was brought up by a respectable father. Yes, respectable,' he said with a sneer, Everything about us was respectable. We lived in a respectable house in a respectable neighborhood, and twice every Sunday we went to church and listened to a respectable clergyman. But, well, here's a chapter out of the inside. I would go to bed and read in bed by a candle. Not a very heinous offense, but contrary to the rule of the house. Sooner or later I would hear a faint scuffling sound in the passage. That was my father, stealing secretly along to listen at my door and see what I was doing. I covered the light of the candle with my hand, 
or perhaps blew it out, but not so quickly but that he would see the streak of light beneath the door. Then the play would begin. "'You are not reading in bed, are you?' he would say. "'Certainly not,' I would reply. "'You are sure?' he would insist. "'Of course, father,' I would answer. Then back he would go, but only for a little way, and I would hear him come stealthily scuffling back again. Perhaps the candle would be lit again already, or at all events uncovered. Would he say anything? Oh, no. He had found out I was lying. He felt that he had scored a point, and he would save it up. So we would meet the next morning at breakfast, he knowing that I was a liar, I knowing that he knew that I was a liar, and both pretending that we were all in all to each other. A small thing, Sylvia, but crowd your life with such small things. Spying and deceit and a game of catch-as-catch-can, played by the father and son. My letters were read. I used to know, for roundabout questions would be put leading up to the elucidation of a sentence which to anyone but myself would be obscure. Do you think any child could grow up straight if his boyhood passed in that atmosphere of trickery? I don't know. Only I think that before I was fifteen my way of life was a sure and settled thing. It was certain that I should develop upon the lines on which I was trained. Garrett Skinner rose from his seat. There, I have done, he said. He looked at his daughter for a little while, his eyes dwelling upon her beauty with a certain pleasure, and even a certain wistfulness. He looked at her now much as she had been wont to look at him in the early days of the house in Dorsetshire. It was very plain that they were father and daughter. "'You are too good for your military man, my dear,' he said with a smile. "'Too pretty and too good. Don't you let him forget it.' And suddenly he cried out with a burst of passion, "'I wish to God you would never come near me.' And Sylvia, hearing the cry, remembered that on the Sunday evening when she had first come to the house in Hobart Place, her father had shown a particular hesitation, had felt some of that remorse of which she heard the full expression now, in welcoming her to his house and adapting her to his ends. She raised her downcast eyes, and with outstretched hands took a step forward. "'Father,' she said. But her father was already gone. She heard his step upon the stairs. Chayne, however, followed her father from the room, and caught him up as he was leaving the hotel. "'I want to say,' he began with some difficulty, "'that if you are pressed at all for money—' Garrett Skinner stopped him. He pulled some sovereigns out of one pocket, and some banknotes out of another. "'You see, I have enough to go on with. In fact—' And he looked northward toward the mountains. Dimly they could be seen under the sickle of a new moon. In fact, I propose to-morrow to take your friend Simon and cross on the high level to Zermatt. "'But afterward,' asked Jane. Garrett Skinner laughed and laughed like a boy. There was a rich anticipation of enjoyment in the sound. Afterward, I shall have a great time. I shall squeeze Mr. Jarvis. It's what they call in America a cinch. And with a cheery good night, Garrett Skinner betook himself down the road. End of chapter 26 End of Running Water by A. E. W. Mason Read by Nicholas Clifford, New Haven, Vermont